Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Foley is Pod. And, of course, we couldn't do it without the hardcore legend himself, the Hall of Famer, Mick Foley. Mick, how are you, man? I'm doing great, Conrad. Um, man, I have been traveling. Uh, as you know, I like to do these in yes. studio. Yes. So I'm really lucky. The next few episodes come from here, right here, at the studio in Huntsville. And I'm looking forward to a great show, but one I have... Some uh, man, it's gonna be I have some trepidation about it because okay. this is not a particularly great memory for me, for reasons we will get into. But other than that, doing pretty good. Well, I um, I know we're not supposed to talk about it, but I saw that another Hall of Famer <laughs> tweeted about little cowboy hats, uh, and maybe you know he had some <laughs> hidden treasures. Yeah. And I know we can't talk about any TV shows no, that you no may TV or may show. not be involved right. in, but I think. Maybe for the first time, you did a little Alabama hidden treasure around the corner here at the studio. Oh, I did, yeah. Technically uh, Tennessee, right? Uh, well, I'm just like, didn't you just take uh, a big old country oh, oh, ship? Oh, you're talking right about that, yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, hey, it, it is part of what we do. I love it. I yeah. I've been I just old. wish we could have bagged it and sold it, you know? I have to, as long as we're on that tack... If you're thinking what I'm thinking. Uh, no, no, that's, that's not what I, you're thinking. I wrote about, I did a nice story, I thought, about a 93-year-old Korean War veteran who was a friend of my dad's. Ran into him at the store, and it was the day before Veterans Day. And I said, hey, Hub, I knew I had a photo of the two of us from like 1982. We sang a song back when we were the BPs. This is, uh, it's all in type there in the... Uh, have a nice day. And the first song we sang was called Ode to Dell, Willie, and Hub. They were the three guys who ran the recreation, <laughs> bi-weekly recreation uh, for our high school and middle school. So we wrote a song and uh, I put up a little uh, dude love doing it. The, the difficulty there is none of me, <laughs> we're an air guitar band, right? right? We don't play our own music. There's no karaoke. So you had to find instrumental tracks and then fit the music into it and looking back on it so i see hub's wife nelly who i've known since i was you know preteens, because hub worked with my dad at ward melville high school uh and she was shocked that i remembered the lyrics of this song which was we would and it goes to the peter gunn theme so it was like we would like to thank you all for letting us play basketball. We really hope you like it. Well, now we we'll sing about Mr. Dell, and then the hub line was the man who gives opponents trouble. His son is Blake. His name is Hubble. So we're really forcing the rhymes in. Yes. But I did. I thought a pretty nice job of uh, writing and paying tribute to this gentleman who served our, you know, a, our, our country at a time when in the Korean War. That was the last conflict where we still had segregated uh, troops. And so that's, uh, you know, every time I see Hub, he's wearing the, uh, the Korea hat. So he's obviously so proud of it. But I just thinking back to that time, that must have been pretty tough. Be f lo fighting for a loving a country that doesn't seem to love you back right. quite as much as it should. But while I was writing that, I mentioned the only reason I even ran into Hub is because I, I I have a rare day off. I make uh, I the day off comes about because one of our shoots that we may or may not be doing has been postponed. I realize, hey, Connecticut, Long Island, I'm going to visit my mom. I have a cup of coffee, and as I hit the road, I start feeling like a churning, right? Here comes the rumble. Here comes the rumble, and now I hit bumper to bumper traffic on the Hutchinson Parkway, and I realize this cup of coffee wants to come back up whether I want it to or not. I go reaching and pawing for the cup itself because I knew I threw it in the back. I can't get to it, and I see to my right hand <laughs> bloodline shirt. And in my head, I think... If I can form kind of a bowl with this, I can throw up in this handmade uh, bloodline bowl and, and no one will be the wiser. That didn't turn out to be the case. Right there in traffic, I realize I throw up and I come out of this situation in worse shape than many of my journeys on Splash Mountain, just literally soaked. 
Because it went chest. right through the shirt. It went right through the shirt. Overspilled it. It was a disaster of epic gastrointestinal disaster you of epic proportion. If you're really parked, you didn't think you could step out? I had no room. It's like cars here, cars here. It's just that boom, that 17 minutes in traffic. I'm I'm looking and there's just nowhere to go. I think maybe if I'd if I'd done the window, but now the cars are only two feet away. I would have basically puked on someone's car. And so I get to my mom's house, all out of detergent, and now I have to make the trip to Walgreens. And that's where I ran into Hub. So I'm so glad that I did. Uh, but I did it. Uh, and I was able to take my sh- shirt off and put on a different shirt. But I'm traveling light. You know that Star Wars Stormtrooper uh, yeah, that's carry on? Bag for a my, yeah, door. yeah. Basically, uh, when they lo- when my bag was lost for 12 days in Australia, I said, I'm traveling light, brother. That means you either find a uh, place to wash your clothes every three or four days, or you use the buy and discard method that I believe was first brought into uh, wrestling by Roddy Piper. Just buy it, leave it, especially when it comes to underwear. So much yes. easier to buy and discard. But anyway, everything's clean. Uh, that's been rectified. But there's my story about uh, bodily fluids. A reversal of fortune. There we go. There we go. Well, um, I was trying to transition about your uh, <clears throat> hidden treasure around the corner. <laughs> we but, all poop, right? Well, I was We all poop. Say, most of us, uh, some of us are still full of it. I do podcasts with some of those guys. <laughs> hey, so, uh, what I wanted to get to is if you're looking to buy some Mick Foley shit, can I recommend next Sunday, right after Thanksgiving, yeah. just in time for Christmas, high spots, auctions.com, a virtual signing. You don't do a ton of these, but no. this is uh, advance notice for everyone next Sunday, get Mick Foley shit. Okay. Not that kind, but yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Whatever you're looking for, they're going to have it there, are they not? It made sense to me because I am going to be doing um, the Winston-Salem. WrestleCade. WrestleCade on Saturday. And then in order to uh, drive home, I have to go right through Charlotte. And uh, so I really like the high spots people. And uh, I don't I don't have any of the memorabilia to, that I can get to. It's scattered in three different storage areas in different states but you know the pops and the lunch boxes all those things people are mailing in their own items so they want to mail in their own items or or use utilize what high spots has built up high spots auctions.com and we're going to have a nice night it's going to be a lot of fun it's next sunday check it out and uh, i'm sure we'll have more mick foley shit coming your way soon uh, speaking of which, we do have a brand new T-shirt that uh, people are starting to dig. The King of the Deathmatch shirt. Did you see yeah, that? How cool I just is saw that? The visual. That's nice. Yeah, it is. That's taking the Wanted Dead shirt to a whole new level, because we did have a version, the Japanese version, right, a few years ago. Uh, that uh, sorry about a young lady named Jessica. I believe her name is Jessica, with Powerbomb Wrestling put out. But this is so much cooler because it's not just that same face that we've seen since uh 95 it's a different look it's got some blood yes and uh, i believe it is going to be an item that a small amount of fans like a lot and that's what's really cool like you don't have to appeal to everyone correct you i would rather have something that a certain amount of people love rather than something that a lot of people go "Eh, it's okay yeah. foliuspodshirts.com pick it up right now and today our topic is what i'm curious about because you said it's a challenging time for you mm-hmm. uh survivor series 1996 is uh what we're talking about i think this is your first pay-per-view appearance in madison square yeah, garden it is so you had been fortunate enough to wrestle in the garden by that point uh, for the wwe but man to be on pay-per-view with yeah. the undertaker in madison square garden that feels like the stuff of little Foley dreams. It does. Yeah. And so it's been built up in my mind as something really big. I, uh, whew, uh, you know, the visualization process is aided by, I, I believe, writing down your goals. Uh, I, I believe sure. in that type of thing. And uh, one of my goals was to sell out Madison Square Garden. One of my goals was to do a buy rate. I can't remember what the rate was, a 1.0 or something like that. And I can't take credit for selling out the garden on this occasion, even though I believe it was sold out. Yeah. Because it's not my main event. When I had been there previously, 
uh, I think it was me and Gold Dust against Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker. That's right. Uh, at that point, people mock it now because it was half a house, but relative to the time, that was good. It was be better than it had been, yeah. and it was a sign that things were on the rise. So much so that um, we had a house show in uh, the Chicago area, not Chicago, but uh, uh, right in the outskirts, yeah. with the Allstate Arena. Uh, the name's going to Rosemont. Rosemont Horizon. Um, the same Rosemont Horizon I ran into a little trouble with when I encountered the people from uh, a TV show wanting to know about Missy Hyatt's lawsuit. Oh, okay. And being somewhat in character, I said the words, on TV, if she can dig into Ted's deep pockets, more power to her, something of that sort. Right. Which I thought was in keeping with the storyline, didn't go over with my... Uh, yeah, you get a I, call I, on that. Yeah, I got a, yeah, I got a, I got a uh, definite call. Um, but now, a couple of years later, the Rosemont has officially sold out, and it's the first WWE show of that magnitude, of a 15,000-seater, uh, to sell out. And so everybody came in, and Bruce and Vince and JR, like, that was a big deal to sell out the Rosemont, and a sign that sellouts were not a given at all at that time. They were a big deal. And we were starting to see genuine increases in house show business across the board, even before the Austin phenomenon took shape. Like we were, uh, we were starting to improve. Uh, but that being said, there's no way I can take credit for that sellout. But nonetheless, it's Madison Square Garden. Yes. It's my first pay-per-view. It's it's Mankind versus The Undertaker. On paper, it's everything I want it to be. And then um, we'll get there. Okay. September, you main event in Philadelphia, yep. Lion Games against Shawn Michaels. We talked about it in the archives. The next month, October, you main event in yeah. a buried alive match against The Undertaker. Things are going so well. You, you have to have exceeded all expectations, mm -hmm. not just from the office, but maybe even what you thought was possible at this point, right? Yes, but with that being said, Mr. McMahon still wasn't really sold on the character. And I don't believe he would be completely sold until the, the interview with JR yeah. in April 97. But even with that in mind, he's still pushing the Mankind character. It's definitely working on some level. And uh, the chemistry with me and Undertaker is great. But now we're in a position where we have literally seen this man buried alive. Right. He has come back to life and we've gone off the air, you know, and then there's that dramatic moment. He's alive. He's alive. No attempt made to resuscitate The Undertaker, and instead the new rockers take on the Bushwhackers. Yeah, in an unadvertised, in an advertised dark match. Because that really sold tickets. <laughs> uh, anyway, I am curious, you know, when you were saying, I don't think Vince was sold, I heard a really smart wrestling mind, and I probably shouldn't say their name. He explained to me a couple years ago, there are attractions and there are opponents. And if you try to make the opponent the attraction, it won't work. Mm. It'll never draw. And I thought to myself, through wrestling history, I can think of circumstances where, man, whenever this guy wrestled that guy, it was a fantastic match. And it drew well and got good ratings and people loved it. But when one of those performers went and did something else, it just wasn't the same. Yeah. And the way you phrased it there, it feels as if maybe Vince thought in 96, Sean was the attraction in September and you were the opponent. And then in October, the undertaker is the attraction yeah. and you're the opponent. But I do think that changed for you. I do too. Yeah. Yeah. I do too. And I think that April interview had a lot to do with it. Uh, I'm okay with being uh, the opponent yeah. as long as I continue to have good opponent, good people to work with. And I think that I had established a good track record of as a guy who could work with just about anyone. Yes. Have good matches. Even as Cactus Jack, the character lent itself well to working with others. It worked with different types of characters. You can kind of tell this is strange. Uh, this is a strange parameter. But when the wrestling magazines, back when they were fictional, when they enjoy writing about a character, it's a good sign that that character is working. Yes. So a guy like Bob Smith, for example, like he really liked writing about the Cactus Jack character in a way that 
others were not enjoyable. You really had to almost pull teeth to figure out what this guy would say. And uh, I think I had that going for me in that I had a track record, one that Mr. McMahon was not aware of, but nonetheless, I had confidence that I could produce if you put me out there with good people or even with, uh, with greener talent. And yeah. I think the program I had with Van Hammer is indicative of that to say, hey, a lot of people want to dog the guy. He was a good looking guy. Yes. He was a very uh, good athlete. He was willing to do what I asked him to do. He was willing to take a couple of, you know, stiff shots when the occasion called for it. And we put some good points up on the board. But again, this is all beneath Vince's radar. He only knows what he sees on that 13 inch monitor backstage. And I'd say uh, you're probably uh, right on the money when you say I was a good opponent, not yet an attraction. Do you, uh, have you heard that analogy before? Do you subscribe to that? theory that there are opponents and there are attractions hmm. i'm going to give that some thought i think when someone continually proves that he's a good opponent he becomes an attraction case in point uh becky lynch yeah becky uh when um when she turned on charlotte i was uh watching i can't remember where i was but with a group of people and when the fans were chanting you deserve it they thought they were chanting, you deserve this to Charlotte, like you deserve to be turned on. And I said, no, I think they're chanting, you deserve it to Becky. And they said, deserve what? I said, the push they think this signals is coming. So I think when you consistently put, well, I'm using numbers, even though it's not technically numbers, but you consistently putting good matches on the board and the crowd now is uh, smarter, for lack of a better word, but m more discerning. Yes. They're not just buying what we are attempting to sell them, and we've seen that time and time again, or else Stone Cold Steve Austin never becomes who he is because he wasn't factored in as a major star. Uh, and I go back to the time that uh, Jimmy Miranda was going around showing me the list of uh, merchandise they wanted to do for me in the summer of 96 and I see my name checked for t-shirt and they wanted to do the mask and I said I don't think there should be a mask because the mask is supposed to be ominous it's not something you can purchase that was my call other people have had the mask sold and it sold and it did really well and I don't think it diminished the character but I thought at that time you shouldn't be able to wear this mask you know now I'm grateful for the uh you know the amazon yeah you know the the, the rubber mask and there's a few uh artisans out there making some really good representations but the only thing they had checked off for me was the mask and the t-shirt uh brother the stalker barry windham had almost everything and mark henry ticked off every single box and when Steve Austin came over, and I know I'm repeating a story I've said before, but I think it puts it into perspective with yes. what we're talking about. He was like, hey, Jimmy, how about a, a T-shirt for Stone Cold? And Jimmy kind of hems and haws, and he goes, ah, Steve, I'm sorry, but the office just doesn't see merchandising potential in you. And they were wrong. And everyone involved would be the first to admit they were wrong about what Stone Cold could be. Yes. So I, at least I was in a, I think WCW was more of an atmosphere where once you had a role, you were stuck in that role. Yes. Whereas WWE, by virtue of the fact that you were literally not playing with someone else's money, you were playing with one man's money, he was going to push the people he thought were going to produce whether or not he had a, 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 a friendship with them or not. So I think... You can be an opponent, but when you're consistently producing, that makes you an attraction in today's, when I say today's world, I'm, ta I'm even going back to 96, 97, because the cat was out of the bag as far as the entertainment aspect. Um, in a weird way, that helped guys like me, because people then changed their perspective and did not say, oh, geez, this guy loses all the time. It was like, wow, does this guy lose with style, right? It, so he, people could appreciate me for what I did instead of dogging me for what I didn't do, which was win matches on a very regular basis. I love just talking wrestling philosophy with you. <laughs> and I know that our topic is Survivor Series 96, but I want to ask, because it is a hot topic. It feels like everybody's talking about it. 
Uh, what do you make of uh, the news about the NWA? Nick Aldis has given his notice. They suspended him. He was off the pay-per-view, off the TV tapings. They held the pay-per-view without him. They crowned a new champion. Tyrus is the new NWA champ. They modified the big gold belt. It's a little bigger now. Maybe looks a little better with Tyrus. But, boy, the internet was picking sides about Aldis and Corgan. And I guess I was out of the loop. Yeah, well, I wanted to see what you thought about the Tyrus thing. If, have you seen any feedback about that? Because it feels like a lot of people are upset. And I wonder, is that based on politics? Or, like, why not give it His a politics, try? politics, man, Tyrus, he's very, you know, no matter what side of the coin you're on, he's a really knowledgeable guy. And I've seen him there on uh, Gutfeld show. I've never seen it, so yeah. I'm, I'm I'm totally removed from most of the politics stuff. So maybe uh, that's well, part I, of it. Well, you know, I see Tyrus taking stands that are contrary to the other people on there, and I don't watch it a lot. Right. I, I honestly, I, I I haven't watched it in a few years, to be honest with you. But you don't need to watch very long to see this is a really knowledgeable guy. And I think that he stands up for things he believes in. And if what he believes in tends to be right of center, I have no problem with that. Right. Um, I don't know if it's a turnoff to people or if they don't think that Alec Tyrus was a fun yes. character. Yes. I mean, hey, I went on my 2012 or 2013 UK tour and I came out. To doing Tyra, I would come out and... Funkasaurus stuff. I'd do the Funkasaurus stuff. I mean, that was a fun, fun. debut for me. Like, yes. I would go, hey, hey, uh, you know, they play my music. And I'd be, I'm, I'm New York Times, two times, number one best-selling author. And you think I'm going to come out to my wrestling theme? That's disrespectful. And then I'd go to the back, let's try it again. And then they'd come out with Tyrus's theme and I'd be in a red, you know, uh, track suit. I love it. With a couple of days. It worked better when I did Billy Gunn's music, you know, like... Hey man, this is a, and I'm giving away a, an entrance. It's actually pretty good that I could rehash, but the more I could cut the promo that made it sound like I was upset without crossing a line where people, where the temperature in the room changed. Yeah. And I did that one night and I knew it. Uh oh, people think I'm really upset and now it hurts the entrance. But when I would make the big thing about being a New York Times bestselling author and then I come out joyfully dancing to I'm an ass man. It just works. So yes. this was, Tyrus was a character, a Brodus Clay, that worked on a certain level. Yes. <sighs> but he wasn't a monster. Yeah. He, they wanted to bring him in as a monster heel. And then I remember Brodus telling me, and then Vince found out I was funny. And he is funny. Yes. And so the Brodus Clay character never got the heel turn that could have turned him into right. a really effective monster heel. I think heel. that's what they're trying to do with yeah. the NWA. Yeah. And I've decided as a wrestling fan, let me take a wait and see approach. And I understand that we're in a weird time politically, and I'm not trying to do a political podcast, right. but I, I was able to enjoy The Sopranos and not know what James Gandolfini's political affiliations were, you, or care. You know, they hinted one time... Uh, when he talked about uh, Santorum, the Pennsylvania senator. <laughs> oh, his character, Tony <laughs> yeah, yeah. Soprano. Oh, okay, now. you don't know of Gandolfini. I, I mean, like the guy who's the playing guy, the yeah. character, like, I don't know or care what his politics are. It was a good yeah. show. And you know, it is a good show. That's the thing is uh, I don't know what it was either. I, I had one personal interaction with James Gandolfini uh, at a Nets game where I think it was his son. If it's not, uh, you know, uh, forgive me for being wrong, but he was a young man with long, dark hair. Yeah. And uh, the Nets used to take pretty good care of me and uh, Dewey. We'd go three, four times a year. And, uh, um, and you know, to this day, uh, the, some of the Nets players from that uh, era, era uh, Richard Jefferson and uh, Vince Carter, they still remember me. And Vince Carter gave me a hug in Memphis, and I remember people with WWE, and I was like, where'd that come from? Yeah, we go way back. As a matter of fact, <laughs> and I know I'm rambling, This is, but I think That's people That's what we're paying for. We love it. Uh, I watched the documentary about Vince Carter and everything he had meant to uh, basketball in Canada as part of the Raptors. And so I tell my son, Huey, the big naysayer, right? I said, yeah, I know Vince Carter. No, you don't, Dad. I go, no, I, I do. Uh, no, there's no way you know Vince Carter. So I tweet out, dear at Mr. Vince Carter or whatever, can you please tell my son that uh, you and I know each other? And within five minutes, oh, man, we go way back. Those were some good times with the Nets. And my stature grew like sure. this in his eyes. I also want to talk to you about why I'm off Twitter. I think 
Oh yeah. Uh, that is, it's kind of a big deal, yeah. and I'm going to use Folius Pod for like breaking news, um, and I think it's the place to break it. But going back to uh, a Tyrus and Nick being off Twitter, I'm not seeing the stuff I used to I see. see. I understand. So I'm kind of blissfully ignorant. That's a nice I way like to it. be. Yeah. I like it. So <sighs> I just don't think. And again, okay, go ahead. I I, I, I want to. As a wrestling fan, I don't regularly watch the NWA. Right. And I don't think a lot of my wrestling friends that I talk to on a regular basis, they don't regularly watch the NWA product either. Right. I'm, I have seen it before. I enjoyed it for whatever reason. Yeah. Life gets in the way. I just don't regularly consume it. But it felt like there was such a visceral response. It's like, wait a minute. This many people don't even watch the freaking show. Yeah. How, how do they feel this strongly where they're just dumping on it? And again, I understand. Or I said to myself, is this political? Because I just think back to like my favorite wrestling memories. I never knew what the political affiliations of any of those guys yeah. were. Nor did I care. Right, right. This is supposed to be my escape and it's supposed to it be fun. It is supposed to be the escape. Yeah. And it kind of takes the fun out of it if it's like, well, I don't like him because he's on so-and-so cable show. What? Well, who cares about that? Right. Like that's, I, don't uh, know. I You know, like. Uh, <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> no. No, you're not wrong. Like, uh, I'm still going to enjoy the heck out of just about every Clint Eastwood movie. Right. You know, uh, if somebody crosses a line and you can't, uh, you know, appreciate the art uh, uh, while, you, you know, can't separate the, the art. art from the artist. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's a that's a line people cross. Some people think I've crossed it. I've had a lot of people uh, who say they're not going to follow me. And I had a colleague, I won't tell you who. Uh, went around, looked at every mean comment that was given to me because I did, you know, before the election. I just said my piece just so I could look in the mirror. And she said, uh, I went through every mean comment, and if they were following me, I blocked them. Because there's a way to there's a way to respond to people, and there's a way not to. And just because you're 800 miles away on a keyboard doesn't mean you should be disrespectful. Yeah, don't be a jerk. Yeah, you can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. Agreed. But we're seeing less and less of that because it's being egged on, because that's how you get known these days. Uh, but going back to Tyrus, I did a, I did a TV taping uh, for Billy Corgan. I enjoyed it. I was so surprised when I saw the level of talent that was there, both sure. known and unknown. Yes. I tried to do the dollars and cents in my head to see how can they afford to bring in these many people and run a show. I don't I don't know the uh, I don't know the economics of their group, but at that time going for the title was uh, Trevor Murdoch and uh, Mike Knox. So Trevor Murdoch, for those who don't know, was a heck of a fighting babyface when he was on the independents. Yes. Because when I uh, retired from full-time wrestling, I was trying to give a thank you to like six or seven people who'd gone out of their way to help me. So I did that by doing a free show. Corny got the free show. Skandar Akbar got the free show. Uh, Harley Race got, there were a couple of them, only about five or six. The problem is everyone else understood it was a one-off, and I guess Harley didn't get the memo, and so I would get that phone call uh, it would, on a message, uh, Cactus, uh, this is Harley Race. I've got a couple shows in Missouri. Give me a jingle if you can. And so I ended up working for Harley for literally one-tenth of what I would get anywhere else. I didn't know how to tell him. Right. Uh, How do you tell Harley Race you can't come in and work for him? But I got to see Trevor Murdoch work quite a bit as a babyface. And I think he was Trevor Rhodes then. Oh, okay. Yeah, he looked, uh, he did look like uh, Dustin. Young Dusty. Yeah. yeah. Uh, He was a really good, effective babyface. And I still think... When he got up on the, uh, that announcer's desk and sang Friends in Low Places, uh, do you remember that? I do. <laughs> he, he just said he wanted a chance to do something. They gave him that shot. And then Trevor told me uh, that he sat down with Mr. McMahon and said, what can I do, you know, to, what can I do to catch your eye? What can I do to move up to the next level? And he said, Vince looked at him and said, I hate that pasty, flabby body of yours. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. So it's kind of tough when you're dealing with a weak genetic hand, and something I know a little about, to become that guy. Um, 
but he did. He he you know he bulked up, you know, and he has that look like that all Japan liked, you know, in the eighties. Just going into Stan another, Hansen. Stan F. Hansen. So when Jericho, for example, when he went over to face uh, Kenny Omega, Jericho had put, he put specifically put on weight. Is his in mind? In his mind, that's what Japanese fans saw as an American main eventer, which is really interesting. You know, they see the way that his mind works. I thought it was interesting that Mike Knox and Trevor Murdoch were going for the NWA Championship. But I think Billy likes the big brawlers yes. on top. That's yes. one of the things about having a company uh, that's you know yours to run. You get to portray yeah. the talent that you want to see there. But Nick Aldis, we he kind of was NWA wrestling, yes. right? He was, like yeah. he was the guy uh, that was in the first of what would become AEW. Before all in. He, all in. He was in that main event, and I don't know if you know this about Nick. And I hope, uh, this is me speaking to Nick uh, specifically, although I guess I could text him. Uh, do you Have you talked to him? Yeah, I'm friendly with Nick. He is one of the funniest guys in a live setting I have ever met. And when I <laughs> suggested that he try to work that into his character, he was like taken aback. And I was like, Nick, like you're, you're really good at this. But I'm telling you, I've been around a long time. We were in Australia. Uh, for House of Hardcore, and it's funny because we're it's a House of Hardcore, and yet we're doing a show at a children's amusement park. Oh wow! And we're doing our signing under a ride that says "Little Butte Toot Toot," and and Nick Aldis does a phenomenal flair, a phenomenal flair, and uh, and as we're and I don't do a great flair, so I'm not trying to mock his Rick impression yeah. by, but I'm trying to say, and he's like. He's like, brother, I have done it all. Raleigh, <laughs> Norfolk, you know, R Raleigh was the Dorton Arena. Raleigh, North Carolina. A little beaut toot toot. And he just had me going. And at a certain point, I was like, Nick, you've got to stop. My back's hurting me. I can't even sign autographs. I'm laughing so hard. And he was doing, <laughs> he kind of does rick as if he's one part rick flair and one part john wayne oh i love that and it's so good a uh, man and some of the stuff he gets into some sort of stuff with uh, tna which is you know personal yeah so i don't i don't want to spoil it. we have nick on sometime just if there's the headline of the day is mick foley believes nick aldis has a much bigger future yes as himself rather than the kind of a stoic representative. The National, the National Yeah. I admire that he's doing that. I think he was doing what he thought he should do to add prestige to that title. Yes. But I'm telling you, he's a wild card in that he is, he's like um, Brad Armstrong in the sense that behind the scenes, he's more interesting than he is on camera. And I, like, I've been in situations where I'm like the sixth or seventh most interesting guy backstage, but then I was able to turn it up a notch yes. when some of the guys could not. And I just think that Nick is a guy who can go into another level, and maybe he needs to leave NWA to do that. Again, I don't know because I've been yeah. off Twitter. Well, he's going. Blissfully ignorant. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think the world of him and Mickey. Absolutely. You know, and I think he's going to land on his feet. Oh, there's no doubt about that. And and I, I kind of agree with you. I, I thought he was doing his best Bachwinkle or Flair or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. just suited and booted. and. Uh, I can't wait to see what's next for them. But I'm pulling for them, and I'm pulling for the NWA. So I, I want to circle back to that before we move along because I know that uh, there's a, it feels like there's a lot of criticism for the NWA. But, boy, Billy Corgan has invested a lot of money, time, mm -hmm. effort, mm -hmm. energy, and cash and created a lot of opportunity for a lot of guys who might not have otherwise right. had it. And I do think there is wisdom. You know, Eric Bischoff always says in business you can be you know, better than, less than, or different than. Well, realistically, it's going to be tough to be better than the, the big two right now sure. just with their budgets and it's just a guy doing it uh so you don't want to necessarily be less than so let's be different than right. so if they're going with more athletic i'm not going to say more acrobatic but more athletic but let's go a little more old school let's go big bruisers mm -hmm. I, I get that and it might not be for you but that's okay well look uh, brian hildebrandt was one of my dearest friends right uh refereed as mark curtis and 
did a great program in uh, in Memphis where he came over with Cornette's guys like an invasion angle, and he got to do some wrestling because if this guy had 40 more pounds on him, he could have been a great cruiser. He was too little even to be a cruiserweight, but he had a mind and a love for wrestling like no other. He loved Memphis wrestling. Remember, I grew up on the old WWF, which then became WWE. So by the time I met Brian, WWE is now in the WWF at that point. They had gone on to the arenas. I think when I did my first uh, enhancement match with the Bulldogs, that may have been the first set of tapings they took to the bigger arenas. But even in Allentown and White Plains Civic Center, you know, it was they were venues. Whereas when Brian shows me Memphis, it's the first time I'd seen wrestling in a studio. I did not get TBS where I was, so I had to learn about uh, what was going on in the world through the Aptor and George Napolitano uh, magazines. There was no kayfabe sheets out at the time, or if they were, they were so underground that I hadn't heard of them. Um, but when I see this, I was like, well, one of the cameras is off color. You know, it was like every time you shoot to it, it was off color. You go, hey, it works in Memphis because that's what they grew up on. And same thing if you were in Georgia Championship Wrestling, which of course became Ted Turner's biggest show and he was loyal to it for a long time because of everything that show had meant to his network. He was loyal to it when there were, you know, the, the, the powers that be wanted it out. And he was like, as long as I'm in charge, wrestling will stay. And then once Ted was, you know, gone, uh, out of the picture, he sold his shares or whatever. If, you know, history, if my memory serves me correct. He lost power. Yeah, and then that's when you saw um, WCW go off the air. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's jump back into it. I'm excited for us to talk about Survivor Series 96. Twitter. I appreciate the, uh, can the I, sidebar. Can yeah, I let's make talk my little Twitter, Twitter we, thing? We definitely need to talk about Twitter. I did leave Twitter. Reason being, it'd be easy to blame the atmosphere on Twitter. That was part of it. Conrad, since day one, I had trouble um, using Twitter in moderation. Okay. So it's mostly on me. Uh, I struggled with it. I think a lot of people do. Um, it's, I spend too much time on it. Yeah. And then you get to where you're spending hours a day just looking at everything on there. And as it became progressively more divisive, I began to feel like I was swimming in a pool full of turds. Oh. One turd, you can dodge that turd, right? You can still enjoy the crystal clear water. But at a certain point, when being on Twitter just becomes an exercise in dodging turds, it's time to get out of the water. And that's what I did. I may come back on after the new year. I may let you guys We'd be glad to. Uh, run the account. We'll because, dodge the turds for you. Because, I mean, I worked really hard to get up to $2 million. Yeah. You know, really did. And it was a struggle over time. And I posted stuff that I thought was interesting and sometimes funny, sometimes relevant. And uh, uh, But I just it just feels like a filthy place for me to be and spend so much time. But maybe after the new year, it'll come back under uh, new ownership. And, <laughs> but when I want to say something, I'll just reach out to Grillo. I'll be yeah. like, hey, I'd like to comment on that match. Yes. And it'll be there for a special announcement. But I do almost feel like I owe it to you guys because you put so much faith in me to do this show. And I think part of the understanding is that I'm going to let people know it's out there. Sure. And it's hard to let them know when your number one, which had been my number one preferred way of doing it, is off the table. So. Yeah. Maybe back under new ownership in the new year. Well, thank goodness for that. And thank goodness that I found a way to save a little cash. Uh, I can't believe this is real, but I signed up for every streaming service under the sun back when the, the whole pandemic first started. Yeah, yeah. When we were locked in, Mick, I signed up for literally every streaming service. Stuff I didn't even know existed, like Epics. I didn't even know what that was. Signed up for it. Got Hulu, got Peacock, got Paramount. I got every single streaming app. Well, now we're all back to work, and guess what? I'm not using most of them. Right. So I signed up for something called Truebill. It's now known as Rocket Money, and boy, am I saving some cash. Let me ask you a question. Do you know how much your subscriptions really cost? Well, most Americans think they spend around $80 a month on subscriptions, but the actual total, well, it's closer to 200 plus. 
That's right. You could be wasting hundreds of dollars each month on subscriptions you don't even know about. And that's where this app I, I, I fell into really took hold for me. It's called Rocket Money. Uh, I first discovered it as Truebill, but you should look for Rocket Money. This app shows you all of your subscriptions in one place, and then it cancels for you whatever you don't still want. Think about that. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions that you didn't even know you were paying for. You might even find you've been double charged for a subscription, and that happened to me. My wife signed up for Hulu. I did too. We're only using the one account. We watch TV together, but we were paying twice. The True Bill has stopped all that. To cancel a subscription, all you have to do is press cancel. Boom. Rocket Money takes care of the rest. So get rid of useless sus- subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com slash Foley. Seriously, you can save hundreds of dollars per year. That's rocketmoney.com slash Foley. Hmm. Cancel your unnecessary subscriptions right now at rocketmoney.com slash Foley. Uh, let's jump back into Survivor Series here, man. Uh, there's, I guess, supposed to be more planned with the uh, Executioner. We first were introduced to him at the October pay-per-view, Terry Gordy under hood. But maybe once we're out of here and, and, and on the road, we realize maybe not so much. How quickly do you think the company realized this isn't exactly what we hoped for? Was it almost immediate? I, I think so. Because um, Michael Hayes, oh man, he was just, he was loyal to Buddy and Terry. Um, he was such a great friend to those guys. And B- Buddy Roberts, some people know, he spent the last several years of his life with uh, talking. Voice box. Though. Yeah, voice box. And Gordy, I think, technically did die on that flight to Japan. He was revived, but uh, was never the same as we talked about in uh, the last episode, King of the Death Match. But from what I heard, Raven was able to have a really good match with him, kind of turn back the hands of times, and maybe gave the impression that Terry had more left in the tank than he did. He, cardio-wise, he was a machine. You know that old, you know the old running the ropes and the baby yes. face holds on and the, you know the heel uh, hits the ropes two or three times and then he realizes he's been made a fool of. Well, Owen, uh, uh, I think it was Owen and, and Davey. You got to, I think they were baby face at that time. But anyway, Terry and I were with them. They did that spot. And Terry ran the ropes for about two and a half minutes. Just kept running in a way that would have worn everybody down. I don't know whether it's that he didn't realize where the pop was supposed to be, but the more he kept running, I mean, it's a ridiculous spot sure. anyway. Uh, but so he could really go as far as cardio. He did have that gas in the tank, but there was just something off. And you couldn't pull Terry and Gordy aside on every TV and every house show and say, open up my eyebrow. Let's make sure these punches look good. And I think it was just obvious from the beginning that... Um, there was something missing. Look, I think Terry, you can't say what someone would have wanted. I don't think he'd mind me sharing this story, but it does stem from the fact Terry, you know, seemed to have a little problem with pills. And we're on an airplane, and I see a woman opening up a pill bottle, and Terry turns to her and goes, got any extras? <laughs> she gives him a couple pills. And in baggage claim, one of the guys says, what, were, what kind of pills were they? He goes, Orangins. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh my God. He had no idea what it was. He had no idea what it was. And it was sad because, look, I was kind of naive in a way to the power and the seductive quality of opioids. But I was riding with Terry. I knew he wasn't drinking. And he went from being. Um, um, Lucid. Lucid to being less than less than lucid, seemingly quickly. And I, what the what the heck? Like, how did that happen? I I should have known, but I didn't know just how quickly if you hadn't been exposed to right, it, how would these you? things go to work. And later that night, I think it was uh, Uncle Paul called me up and said, "We have to find Terry." And so we had to go searching, and it was like you were dealing with a child in some ways. And I remember, I think we found him at a local bar, and I said, Terry, we have a good thing going here. We have to keep it. And he had those puppy dog eyes, 
And he was such a good-hearted guy. Deep down, I think I mentioned on uh, my first trip to uh, for, to Japan for Baba, he bought some uh, you know little speakers back when the Walkman were the you know height of technology, and he gave me his old set of speakers. Wow! And it was like this is Terry Gordy, one of the best workers yeah. in the world. He gave me his speakers. Did you know? And I was like, I was a different type of cat anyway. I was a guy who would have been easy to pick on. But the fact that a lot of people, even if they they saw something in me, and Terry was one of those guys who saw something in me, and it just it hurt me to see him reduced to that level he was as the executioner, you know. So that when we were doing the buried alive, I mentioned as we're furiously trying to fill this thing with with uh, with earth, there's Gordy like with his back to the hole, like just scooping like it was a cat, a, a cat in the in the litter box. I thought Terry hung on until the December pay-per-view. Oh, yeah, he was there. Okay. Um, but the, but the, the bloom was off the rose. Like, yeah. whatever long-term plans there were. Uh, yeah, and I think that may have been part of the trouble there is that they did not necessarily have a plan f going forward after Survivor Series. And if memory serves me correct, I think I was off the next pay-per-view because I actually sat in the stands Chattanooga was close enough to Atlanta. I brought my wife and kids with me, and I had my hair up under a hat and, uh, you know, down low, and I sat in the friends and family section, and only a few people even knew who I was. Uh, so that would be indicative of the company not knowing how to make that transition, partly because I think the executioner uh, stalled out a little bit. So the other thing that's happening is not only is uh, maybe the bloom coming off the rose with Gordy, but after Buried Alive, the buildup to Survivor Series doesn't show you on TV a whole lot. Instead, yeah. they're spending a lot of time focusing on the return of Bret Hart. It's, it's announced amazing. officially. Just throwing a piece of earwax in the garbage. Was that real earwax? Yeah, just a little bit. It wasn't that marble that I talked but about. I mean, but it made a sound. It did. It was substantial. <laughs> These hidden treasures just keep <laughs> popping up all over town. Um, Bret Hart coming back, man. Yeah. This has to be something that you have to be excited about because if you're a top heel and he's a top baby face, oh, you know man. you can have some good matches when he's here, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Bret was really uh, tailor-made for me. I only had two singles matches with Bret and a bunch of tags. Uh, one single was Shotgun Saturday Night, and Bret was telling me about it. I, I had a chance to spend some time with him. And I always knew Brett loved that, uh, the knee, running knee in the corner. And I told Brett, uh, he got together with me and asked if there was anything I want to do. And I was like, you know, this is shotgun Saturday night. It's supposed to look rough around the edges. Why don't we just call it in the ring so it has that rough quality to it? Uh, and aside from, I think I messed up a neck breaker because I always had trouble knowing which, which side? side to go to. Other guys, clockwork, but me, I, I, Is there a right side or correct side? Uh, or wrong it hand depends hand? on who's giving the neck breaker and which way they go. So I, I botched that night and I also botched one time with Lawler, uh, in the King of the Ring tournament. It's embarrassing when it happens, especially because if you do it right, you know, I mean, that's a move that theoretically could do a lot of damage yes. if you're not working together. And so it's embarrassing, and it's more dangerous if you don't do it correctly. Um, but aside from that, we had a good, solid match. And then the other match was either Birmingham, UK, or Manchester. I can never remember which. And it was one of two house show matches I wish I had on tape. Wow. The other being a match with Shawn Michaels at the Garden, where everything just it feels magical. Uh, and so I loved working with Brad, have the highest respect for him. He, he was like, oh, oh, here it comes. He thought the running knee was, uh, you know, was going to, you know, maybe do some damage. Now there's a reason why we don't call it the running flaccid inner thigh. It just, doesn't, <laughs> it just doesn't have the same no, level. The pasty of, yeah, white. Yeah. yeah. But I, you know, there was always just a little, uh, yeah, it's where it carried a little bit of my fat on the inner thigh. And so he said it was like a big pillow hitting him, like a big pillow. So I would have loved to have worked with Brett. I was fortunate to have had the, the two matches I did and the tags, but Brett coming back was a big, it was a big deal. And I underst understandably, a lot of other things took a back seat once Brett came back. The running knee, are you saying on the outside where the stairs are or in the corner? The one in the corner. Okay. But it would be the same, the same move in the stairs 
just using the stairs as the place where I make a lot of the contact. A lot of noise. Yeah, a lot of noise. Yeah. So I'm fascinated by this because we've talked about it a lot here on the show this year that Mark Mero comes in with a bigger guarantee roughly the same time that you and Austin comes in do. not with a bigger guarantee but a guarantee. Uh, guarantee. Yeah, yeah, he was the first he was the first one. And now in this era, you know, just a handful of months later, here we are as we cruise towards November, he's in a feud with Hunter for the Intercontinental title. You're not in the title mix, but you've main evented with The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels, and you're in a really serious feud with The Undertaker. And now Brett's coming back, who's really been, you know, the the face that runs the place, so right. to speak. And he's going to be working with Steve. Uh, he, it's starting to feel like you guys got the better end of this deal. You're working with the bigger stars, the main events, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's also a big... And it's word on Mark Merrill. Yes. What a great human being. Of course. He really is. I mean, I, I don't know if I said this on the show, but I saw Mark at a uh, hotel about five, six years ago. Mrs. Foley and I uh, were having a little uh, adults, you know, time together. So, we, you know, we it's good for I, anyone out there. I tell people when they ask me on... Uh, on cameo for relationship advice i said don't get so busy in the game of life you forget to make each other feel special and so we would get have our getaway once in a while I ran into mark and i said mark i want to apologize to you i said i was pretty tough on you and really envious of the contract you had uh i'm sorry that i let that get in the way of our friendship we shook hands we hugged it out and that's what dudes do yes. right that's what you do and I think that there are some people in the world who are still here who would not be here had they not uh, heard Mark and these incredible yes. talks. I Man, I take my hat off to him because that's got to be a tough place to go emotionally for him. Case in point, when I did the, um, when I did, uh, the 20 Years of Hell tour, about four days before the taping, I came to the ending I wanted, which was hard-hitting and emotional uh, and serious, uh, where I said that instead of having holding a grudge against this match, I accept it on behalf of everyone who ever made such a great sacrifice. Like, I get to hold that mantle, but I hold it for people like Leon White. The idea that Leon used to get teased and knocked for being soft is ludicrous to me. Because he wrestled a match after his eye came out, and yeah. his eye came out of his yeah. socket. Yeah. And he pushed it back in, and, and he worked going. with Stan Hansen at a you know at a stadium show in Japan. And then I mentioned, um, I think Benami Toyota, who broke her neck in the first fall of a two out of three, and finished the matches holding her head aloft. And then the young lady from High Spots. Oh my God, I can't believe I can't remember her name. Uh, who worked for eight years after being in an accident that was profiled on Forensics File, on uh, uh, Headline News. Uh, I was so stunned when I, you know, there was this young lady left for dead, not supposed to walk, not supposed to talk, and you follow her course, and she's actually one of the interview subjects, which is very unusual on Forensic Files, because usually that subject is deceased. No longer with us. And uh, I know we're going way off track, but I think this is a, a, a you know I think this is a a good road, to, a good path to take. Is uh, when the show ends, they put up a little uh, a little post note, and they say that she passed away. And here I am at three o'clock in the morning, going, "How could she pass away?" And I start googling her name. First thing that comes up is this woman's name. Ah, it's going to kill me. Uh, Grillo, any way you might be able to work on this? Uh, and she was good friends with Daphne. And I see this versus Daphne, wrestling match. No, can't be the same person. I do a little more research and I get come to the obituary and it says she worked with high spots. And that's where I reached out to Daphne and I said, Daphne, this is this is you? And I, you know, the way the business is, you, you have friends, you, you don't see them for a while. And I said, listen, I said, can I call you? Because I hadn't, you know, the old-fashioned phone calls. We probably talked for about two hours that night on the phone. And so what I said that night, and I'm going to get back to why this applies to Mark Merrow, is that uh, what some people may have seen as a match full of botches, 
I saw as one of the most magnificent things I'd ever seen. Here's a young lady who was never supposed to walk or talk. She's having a freaking wrestling match. Yeah. Daphne slipped her over without telling her, and it was the only match she ever had. She trained for eight years to have that one match, and wow. I just thought that was tremendous. But as it applies to what I said about Mark Merrow, is like, once I did that episode, once I had the thing on tape, I just thought, I can't go there anymore. I cannot deal with this type of heaviness on a nightly basis. Mark deals with it every, every day. day, every day. And he, uh, granted, you know, he makes money, he's a touring speaker, but what he does is just, you know, Phenomenal. man, it's incredible. So hats off to Mark Merrow, but let's continue. Uh, That's the long, long, long version of saying, bless his heart, but. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, seriously, wherever, whatever he's doing, yeah. bless him. He's doing a, a lot of great work. Um, Kurt Henning, Mark Miro, and Hunter Hearst Helmsley are all embroiled in a little storyline at the time. Allegedly, Kurt's planning a comeback to the wrestling ring. He's been shooting an angle with Mark and Hunter. He's going to turn heel on Miro, side with Hunter, and then, what do you know, Kurt walks and winds up going to WCW. Yeah. Do you remember this story? Yeah, I remember being there. I remember remember what a shock it was to no longer have Kurt there. I never got to know Kurt that well. I think our bonding moment was being upstairs in the Herb Abrams penthouse suite when he showed us the cowboy boots that he was going to be wearing on the following night. The yellow thing. cowboy boots. The yellow cowboy boots, yellow ostrich skin with the UWF. And as he's talking, here's Kurt and I, who don't know each other well at all at this point, and we're kind of looking at each other like, what in the world are we, you know, like this is, what are we doing here? But I always liked Kurt, and Kurt was a locker room leader, and he was, you know, he was a practical joker, and he was funny. Um, his leaving was a, was seen as a that was a big blow. Oh, yeah, it was Mr. A, Perfect. Yeah, was a Mr. Big Perfect. Character. Yeah, yeah, and he was Mr. Perfect. Kurt Hennig, so he could go next door to WCW and be Kurt Hennig. And did you uh, did you ever fall victim to any Mr. Perfect ribs? I, I never did fall victim to any ribs. No, no. Darn it. Uh, so as part of the Fort Wayne uh, taping after uh, Buried Alive, so the very next day. You're going to do an interview with Doc Hendricks and Paul Bearer and the Executioner, all of you guys, in the ring together. And they're going to announce a Survivor Series rematch with you and The Undertaker. This is literally one day after you killed him mm -hmm. and buried him. And Uncle Paul will be suspended above the ring in a shark cage. That's old school right there. Yeah, yeah. Had you been involved in a match where someone was suspended above in a shark cage before? <sighs> That's like old school wrestling right there. Let <laughs> me just take you back for a second. One of my favorite promos that never aired was in WCW when Paul Heyman was supposed to be uh, uh, suspended over uh, the ring in a shark cage. And, and Steve Austin cut a promo that didn't air because Bill Watts hated it. When he said, Paul, this is, he goes, uh, he was saying Paul should take it as a compliment. And he was saying, look at Paul Heyman. His, his flesh is pale. His heartbeat is weak and erratic. <laughs> saying that they, but they had the baby face, Steamboat, so scared that they had to have Heyman over the... And Watts cut the promo because he didn't like the whole, oh, his heartbeat is weak and erratic. Well, that's a hilarious promo. <laughs> it's a I great, love it. It's a great promo. I thought a great character building promo and a hint a harbinger, if you will, of what Steve was going to be capable of doing. But I believe this was the first time I worked in a match with somebody suspended over the ring. But it is great old school wrestling. It feels like a Jimmy Cornette idea. It feels like a Cornette idea. I don't know for sure. It's old school Cornette stuff, for sure. Yeah, yeah. The uh, name you were looking for earlier, I think, is Vicky Lyons. Vicky Lyons, there yeah, Vicky Lyons. God bless her. Uh, so and God bless. And Daphne's not here either. So, what uh, a shame. Oh man, what just awful. Uh, back to this shark cage promo. Taker's voice is going to come through the PA system. It's going to interrupt you and then reveal a shark cage at ringside with a dummy hoisted upside down, uh, which of course is supposed to represent what the Undertaker will do to Paul Bear at Survivor Series. Man, we're just loading this thing up. We got yeah. boiler room brawls. We got buried alive. Now we're going to have a shark cage. We're having a shark cage, but we're going from boiler room brawl 
to buried alive to a regular wrestling to a match. regular wrestling match should have been the opposite order right, right. Yeah. and it's also now our fourth pay per view this year in a five month period yeah June to October or yeah. to November yeah yeah and compounding uh, that that issue is that Undertaker is going to emerge from the rafters with a new look. Yes, and we're going to get there, but I, okay. I want to circle back to what you just said because I think that gets lost a lot. Four four matches in five months on pay per view, and you won them all. No, no, no. I won the first two, well, okay, uh, but I but I guess you could say. Uh, I mean, buried alive him. was uh, technically <laughs> they called the match. He may have technically and, won, but he got buried. Uh, yeah, uh, Car- <laughs> Steve Kornacki came out and called it in my favor. He went to the big board. He said, "Holy, yes. holy Undertaker wins." And at that point, uh, my buddies came out and we buried the Undertaker alive. So I guess you could say, by virtue of the fact that he needed to come back to life. <laughs> <laughs> to take me on, yeah, I was, yeah. You're three and zero. Yeah, three and zero against the big guy, and but now we have to up that ante somehow, and I don't know going in if just having Paul suspended above the ring is going to be enough. Part of this promo doesn't even air the promo you're doing because they're doing cutaways for the old skit from Brian Pillman's house where they're doing mm-hmm. the gun angle gets them in a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of folks have had different opinions about that. Some say this is the beginning of the Attitude Era and they're trying to really push the envelope. Others would say guns have no place in wrestling. Others say, ah, it's just storytelling. And everybody remembers Vince taking the big swig of water. We make movies. <laughs> what do you think? Is this fair game or is this too much? Let's keep the firearms out of it. We took a shot at it. Let's <laughs> just, upon. let's learn, let's learn uh, that uh, there are other ways to threaten human lives. Edge did the home invasion and slapped uh, uh, Mr. Cena. And by the way, if you haven't read Brian Gewertz's book, it's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic, and his backstory behind that skit is is laugh out loud funny because I only knew what I saw on the air, which is pretty good. Yes. But apparently, they really had to jump through some hoops to <laughs> bypass Cena. Have you heard Cena. Brian tell the story? <laughs> In his own voice? No, no. He does a great John Cena senior impression. <laughs> Phenomenal. He was using terms like chicky poo. Yes, all that. <laughs> I'm gonna send you to the moon. All that, you know. Why I oughta, you know, all that. All and school. Cena senior is a great character. I actually know great Cena guy. senior better than I know John. Really? Because uh, he and I have bonded over the Santa thing. So okay. when I see him in an indie, we get we talk for hours. I love it. This is your way of saying this show is not about John Cena Sr., but anyway, you okay, okay. So no. We'll do another episode specifically about Cena Sr. I hope it's a three-hour episode. And we'll bring him in here. Why I ought to? <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Dude, that would be so good. <laughs> you know, you and I are going to hit the road in 2023. We'll probably do a live show in the Boston area. Oh, let's Maybe do go it. hit some Kowloons and hang out with John Cena Sr. If Kowloons is still there, they may have oh, torn buddy, it down. They do that going out of business sale shit every year. Uh, Grillo, can you see if Kowloons is still, the Kowloon is still in business? I'm sure it's still in business. I don't know. Andy's been teasing that they're leaving forever. It's like those furniture stores that are perpetually going out of business. Here's our going out of business sale. There's one here on the parkway. You, it's been doing it since 2001. That was 21 wow, years ago. Yeah. They're going out of business. Did you know what Andy Wong procured for me? What did he procure? Two original orange seats from the Worcester Centrum. How about that? That's pretty cool. Which meant absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't have the connection, but I did write a good deal of Foley's Good while sitting in that chair. That's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool. But the thought that counts, that was very thoughtful. So you uh, wound up defeating Freddie Joe Floyd, a.k.a. Tracy Smothers, at this Fort Wayne taping. Uh, and this match airs on the Go Home edition of Raw, which airs November 11th. Uh, we lost Tracy Smothers yeah. not too long ago. And I don't know anybody who didn't love Tracy Smothers. Yeah. Uh, you got any good Tracy Smothers stories? Oh, man. You know, that, that's a, that was such a difficult situation for me because he comes in as Freddie Joe Floyd. He, Tracy had been on every single IWA Japan tour that I was on, which was, sorry about that, I think 11 or 12 tours. 
he was the only constant. It was me, Tracy, and Rick Patterson on every tour, and then the guy jeans would uh, rotate uh, around, uh, aside from the core nucleus. And so it was, to see a guy that good with such a lame gimmick, uh, <coughs> at a time when WWE decided they needed like supercharged enhancement talent, and that's when they came in with Alex Porto as the pug, Wild Bill Irwin as the goon, yeah. um, Dirty White Boy Tony Anthony as T.L. Hopper, literally coming out to the sound of a toilet flushing. That's and, money right there. And Freddie Joe Floyd, the name is a, it's a rib on, uh, or a tribute to uh, Gerald, Gerald Briscoe. Briscoe. And uh, when he came back from, uh, if it wasn't my match, it was one before his brother, when I heard those banjos, I knew I was done. Like, he knew he wasn't going to be pushed. So, uh, yeah, man, it's difficult when there's somebody you genuinely like, you see that his career is not going like you think it should, but you're in a position where you have to look strong. So, in answer to favorite Tracy Smothers story, and this is one of my favorite stories to tell when I'm live, I want to do the live shows, is uh, I'm getting motivated to do that first, my first ever no rope barbed wire match with Terry Funk. I think it's January 10th. I always get the town wrong. I thought it was Guma, as I think it might have a different name, but it was a prefecture, like a little suburb of Tokyo. Only 150 people because they didn't heat the buildings. So 150 people in their winter coats, but it's no rope barbed wire. We see the Japanese contingent out there in force, the media contingent. Terry and I don't even see each other, let alone have a chance to talk because he's dressing in a different side of the building. That's the way it was some of the time. Not all of the time, but we both understand, like, we have a chance to try to put this promotion on the map in front of 150 fans, but with a match that up to half a million diehard fans will see in brilliant living color within three days' time. So I go and I, I go into my cassette bag and I come out with Little Earthquakes by Tori Amos, you know? And I listen to it like six times in a row. For those people out there don't know, I'm a big time Tori Amos fan, love that song, Winter. And I look like I'm flying on a cloud, you know? And Tracy Smothers senses that. He looks at me, he goes, Cactus, there's not too many people out there. Promise me you won't do anything crazy. And I looked at him like it was the most absurd request of all time. And uh, no one tells a badass story about me clearing out a bar room or anything no. of that nature. But I'll put my reply to Tracy Smothers up there with the most badass real life words ever spoken. Tracy Smothers says, you be Tracy Smothers, say Cactus. There's Cactus, not there's not a lot of people out there. Just promise me you won't do anything crazy tonight. You know I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, and I went out there, and Terry Funk and I just tore each other apart. I mean, it was obscene, the type of stuff we were doing to each other. And it was like, yeah, I know that the hangman cost me my ear, but doggone it, I'm going to do it in barbed wire tonight. And so, you know, the visualization process that I was so proud of was like, no doubt, that hangman, a lot of timing, right? Like timing, you have to be flying over the top rope while catching yourself, when it was ropes, catching yourself between the second and third, pulling the second strand over the top rope in a way that no one can identify while you're doing it. But now I'm going to do it in barbed wire. And never once gave a moment's thought to whether or not the wire would actually hold my body weight, which as it turns out it did not. <laughs> and there's this photo of me sitting on the ground with my two fingers suspended by the wire. And so Tracy was there. I nearly lost those bad boys. He's wrapping them up. You look in, you, there's such a the chunks of flesh are up. You can see the fingers of my pinkies. And he's like, oh, cactus, this isn't good. And he's wrapping those SOBs up. Gets me, gets me to where I can get on the, uh, the bus uh, to make it to uh, the hotel. And the next day, we're getting ready to go. Uh, I didn't super glue it. I think I new skinned it, which was like uh, a more expensive super glue. Yeah. And, and then I had the, the big, you know, wrestler's uh, adhesive tape like this. Sure. I'm afraid I'm going to draw attention in the airport, all the adhesive tape. So I'm in the, uh, Tracy, come on in here. I'm going to try to take his bandage off. And I take the bandage off, and I don't know if it actually squirted or ran, but within seconds, I look every bit as bad as I had the night before. Just blood 
<laughs> pouring down my face. I'm in a foreign country, and I don't know what the heck I'm going to do. So my fondest memory is of Tracy trying to warn me not to say anything, do anything crazy, and frantically trying to patch up the hardcore legends so I could make my flight home. And what I remember when I get back, uh, I'm at JFK Airport. JFK, or was I, I can't remember if I was living in Atlanta at the time, either JFK or Atlanta. And the police dogs start going freaking crazy with my, my check bag. They're just, <laughs> What's in there? My stuff, it's so bloody. Oh. It's so freaking bloody. And I, they, they're looking for drugs. And I was like, the question was like, could it be the blood? And they go, oh, you have bloody garments? And then I've got to tell them what I am and who I do. And I break out the stuff. And it's just saturated. I think I sold the shirt. But the, tr but the tights are just covered in blood. So the dogs had a field day. And this is back... <laughs> when you would, uh, before they started checking real closely uh, at security, you got all your t-shirt money like underneath the insole in your shoe. Uh, and you can't bring back more than nah, X number of dollars. Right, and I, I don't even think I had X number of dollars. Well, uh, no, because uh, you know, I don't think I did. I think it's 10,000. It's 10,000 now. Believe me, I wasn't bringing home 10 grand from uh, an IWA tour. You know, weekly fee of three thousand. I wasn't, you know, maybe I made another two thousand a week on on gimmicks, uh, but still, I was stuffing that stuff underneath the. Uh, uh, they're wise to that now, you know, with the insoles. But that was my favorite story about Tracy's mother's. He was just such a great road companion. Uh, you know, when you're together, you know, ten days a month for uh, twenty four seven practically. He was just a great guy and a really good hand who could work with anybody. He even worked well with the bear. He had three matches with the bear, and unlike me, who I think the bear was my third match. By the way, we're not saying Godfather. We mean an actual wrestling bear. <laughs> yeah, the wrestling bear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wasn't. That's even, a sentence a lot of people don't understand. They don't understand. They had wrestling bears. There was an actual a yeah. working bear. Right. He was one of the boys. <laughs> he, he, he tracked the beers. He had he had the cubs. Uh, <laughs> There's a really there were other wrestling bears. The Canadian bear man trained them. There was a terrible tragedy that took place. You know, one of the bears attacked and killed the bear man's wife. You know, just a disaster. Um, but I didn't this, know that. Did yeah, you know? yeah, it was bad. Uh, obviously, awful. Uh, I'll counter by the, telling the funny story about the um, the bear would be brought in. This was serious business. It wasn't just an attraction. The bear would be brought in, especially in the southern territories, when a heel had heat and no human being could uh, could um, uh, could withstand the power of the bear. Bear is arguably five, six to seven times. Why are you laughing? You know where this is going? No, I'm just thinking about. I actually hung out with Tracy a few years ago. Randomly, he was at an indie show here in Huntsville. Yeah. And we went and got pizza after or something. And one of my buddies said, hey, man, who was your toughest opponent? And he told the bear story. Yeah. I guess he, as you said, multiple times. And so as he's telling the story, the bear swatted at him. And so we're like, well, what'd you do? Well, I hit that motherfucker back, all this. <laughs> and so we're just laughing at the absurdity of a man fighting a bear. And so we were like, well, how was the match? And he goes, it was the shit that bear couldn't work worth the shit. <laughs> <laughs> But Tracy was, I saw a video of Tracy doing a leapfrog yes. out of the corner. All I did was I jumped on the bear's back. It stood up, threw me about eight feet. And I was like, ah, I'm done for the day. But Tracy actually had, he actually had a match with the bear. But the story is, keep in mind, Southern Heel, got a lot of heat. Coming out, he's going to take on the bear. And one of the fans plays the ultimate rib, pats the heel on the ass. With honey. With a handful of honey. And now you got this guy who's worked on his heat, probably has to fight his way out of buildings now and then. Bear immediately takes him down and starts... Having his way. Having his way with that man, with his tongue. Even though they're muzzled, by God, that bear was trying He's to He's going to find a way. He was going to find a way into that sweet spot. Shout out to Tracy Smothers. Yeah. Uh, that bear couldn't work worth a shit. <laughs> by the way, we mentioned earlier, I want to uh, extend our sincerest condolences. I know... You probably don't know this either because I just learned it myself. But 
as folks are listening to this, yesterday, uh, Andy had to bury his his mom, Madeline, uh, Andy Wong. So oh, the no. Kowloon family was uh, actually closed for lunch as you're listening to this yesterday, so they could all attend the funeral. Uh, but KowloonRestaurant.com. Uh, if you're ever in that area, uh, the Boston area, if you will, the Saugus area, you should definitely go check it out. Never had a bad meal. Never had. So it's still open. Let's, let's do it. Let's plan on it. They're never going out of business. Just man, it's, it's such a huge business. By the way, so wrestling friendly. If you're listening to this, you'll appreciate this. This past weekend, they had meet and greets with Money Inc., Ted DiBiase, <laughs> IRS, Jimmy Hart, and Demolition. And you can get some badass Chinese food. Oh, How about man. that? You know, Al Snow turned to me like in the mid 2000s when uh, the uh, Kowloon had become the place to go. Yes. And he goes, you know you started all this. I said, what do you mean I started all this? He said, you used to show up with Phil Castanetti, who owns Sports World. He said, you were the first wrestler who frequented Kowloon's and you brought a few people and word got around and it was bam. It's like wildfire. We're now after a show at the TK, is it TK Gardens? Uh, TG, yeah, TG Gardens. TG Gardens. You know, you have a two, three hour wait with wrestling fans uh, waiting. I'm not saying it's not worth the wait, but uh, man, it's really grown into something really special. So, yeah, uh, Andy, if you're out there listening, uh, God bless you. Uh, um, Shout out to Andy and the whole Wong family. Yeah, yeah. Hate to hear about that. And I guess since we're. Talking about folks we've lost, we should mention now, you actually knew Nick Carter. I did. Or Aaron Carter. Aaron Carter, yeah, yeah. So I spent some time a couple weeks ago working on a story just because I thought uh, a lot of people are it's just going to be, hey, he was a big star. Right. Uh, succumbed to his demons, which is true. But in this case, uh, he really made a special moment for my children because... Uh, uh, his album, his second album was huge. That's how I beat Shaq. I want candy. There were like three or four songs that were really catchy, and my kids would be singing their hearts out in the back seat. And my wife and I kind of nudging each other about how cute that was. So, when we found out he was playing Joan's Speech, I pulled a couple strings, got a couple tickets, and when I got there, I was asked if I wanted to introduce Aaron. The audience, yeah, sure. And now this is something I've never seen. Um, some kids are playing, these kids, seven, eight, nine years old, they're playing uh, basketball. There's a little basketball hoop in the back of the uh, uh, Jones Beach. Aaron comes off his bus, starts playing pickup basketball with his fans. And what I really stands out, A, he was such a good sport. He wasn't trying to dominate. He wasn't gra grabbing rebounds. He wasn't <laughs> shoving kids out of the way. He, my son Dewey was getting upset because he couldn't sink shots, and I'm trying to impress on Dewey the magnitude of the occasion. It's not about sinking shots. You're playing pickup basketball, with Aaron Carter. One of the kids throws a piece of bologna at him, and it sticks to AC's face. And then the other kids, even though they idolize him, are throwing cold cuts at the teen idol, who instead of getting angry is like playing off, playing it off, and he's got these facial expressions going. And I was just marveling about how cool this is. And then he had his girlfriend there at the time, Lindsay Lohan. Lindsay took photos with our kid, with my kids. And fast forward about four months, I'm at a Marty Lyons uh, Foundation fundraiser, and we're signing autographs. And Lindsay's sitting next to me, and talked to me the whole time because she and Aaron were going through a little trouble, wanted romantic advice, and it was just so cute. It, it really hurt me when I saw her uh, fall in, you know, in, in, and have so many problems. It looks like she's making a, a comeback now, yeah. but man, to start, you know, childhood stardom, it's easy. It's, it's not easy to, uh, to grow through. I mean, uh, man, they had a long, long list of people who really got tripped up by it. And Aaron was one of those people, but he, he created a great memory. Yes. Also one of my most embarrassing moments because we're sitting center side of the stage, which is a great place to sit. You know, the acoustics aren't as good, but yeah. you're right to the side of the stage. And I hear, and I'm there, I have Dewey and Noel with me. I think they're six and eight years old at the time. And he says, hey, this is the time of uh, the show where I dance with one of our fans and we've got a big fan here tonight a real big fan. And I start thinking, is he talking about me? 
and he brings me out there to dance with one of those huge styrofoam cowboy hats. You've seen Dude Love, yes. right? The deal is, it's fun to watch a guy who can't dance dance in his own atmosphere. Yes. But now I'm in a completely foreign atmosphere. I stink the place up. I walk back to my chair with my head down. I sit down, and Noel is six years old, and she looks at me and goes, I'm so embarrassed. Oh, that's <laughs> true. That's embarrassed. That's hilarious. So, yeah, uh, Godspeed, Aaron Carter. You entertain a lot of people, yes. made some special memories along the put, way. Put a lot of smiles on a lot of faces. Yeah, he sure did. He sure did. I like your idea, though, or maybe it wasn't your idea, but maybe we should adopt it. we got to get throwing cold cuts <laughs> as a thing. Don't you think? <laughs> got to be. Hey, hey, Thanksgiving episodes coming around, WWE, it wouldn't be the first food fight. I'm just saying, if you don't like that Tyrus is the NWA champion, Throw cold buy a ticket, go to the show, Throw cold cuts. hit that motherfucker with some bologna. <laughs> and then, what? It could work? What if we create a new trend? This is bologna. Speaking of bologna, if you're ready to sling that bologna, Blue Chew is our sponsor again this week. We're coming to you live from the Blue Chew studios. and we If all you're ready to sling that bologna. Sling that bologna. <laughs> I'm just trying to freestyle here. Oh, and you're succeeding. Uh, we all know confidence can take you far in life. I mean, you might even get out there with tie-dye and dance with a cowboy hat. You know, I don't know. Uh, it's especially true in the bedroom. Uh, that's where Blue Chew comes in. We mm. consider it almost like a hot tag for your wiener. Uh, Blue Chew, of course, is the unique online service that delivers you the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form yeah. and at a fraction of the cost. Let me just explain. It's going to get your ding-dong real, real yeah. hard. Uh, you can take them anytime, day or night, so plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. And the process is simple. You'll sign up at bluechew.com. You'll consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. No visits to the doctor's office. No awkward conversation. No waiting in line at the pharmacy. Bluechew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. And if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, Chew it and do it. Have some better sex, y'all. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free. When you use our promo code Foley at checkout, just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. The promo code is Foley, and you'll receive your very first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring this podcast and allowing me to say, sling that baloney <laughs> on a podcast. Um, uh, let's talk about the new look The Undertaker is going to reveal or unveil had you did you have any idea that that was the plan had he discussed that with you did you know what it would look like before you got there i was thinking about that on the way over you know i don't like to look at the notes right, right? but this was one i just i did not recall as much and certainly don't recall it as fondly as all the other uh big matches i had with the undertaker i guess you had to have a different look because by some standards he was deceased Again. Again. You killed him for the third time. The third time, and we accept that with that character. Yes. That he can perish and come back to life. We understand on a certain level he's a guy, and now we know he's a guy who goes on Instagram, right? We know he's a guy. But at that time, man, even among the wrestlers, his gimmick was so respected and protected that you bought into the idea that this conceivably could happen when you suspend disbelief. But that if it was going to happen, he couldn't come back looking the same. What uh, I enjoyed was uh, whenever he died against Yokozuna, you know, and they, yeah. they send him to heaven. So you get the visual of him going up. And now, after you've killed him and buried uh -huh. him and lightning was summoned inside a building, I don't know how they could do that. <laughs> Couldn't figure out the sleigh for you. Couldn't figure Not out how to have me fly into the sky on a sleigh with Santa, but they can change into our weather patterns. No problem. Yeah. But now he's going to descend in this match, down from the heavens again. Did you know any of that was happening ahead of time before you get to the building? I can't remember it was before I got to the building, but, but I do know it rendered communication almost impossible. So we've got a situation where we now are in a plain wrestling match, given, all right, I'll be at uh, Paul, uh, Uncle Paul's in a shark cage above the ring, but essentially it's just a regular match on the heels of a match where we buried each other alive. You were in a boiler room? Boiler room, right. Uh, and then buried alive? And now we've got to do a regular match. 
with a guy who's up in the rafters most of the day and communication is almost zero. I believe he may have had some type of walkie-talkie, but memory serves me correct, it wasn't working very well. So essentially, we have to call it in the ring, which is fine under most circumstances, but it's our fourth PPV. And there was also, I think, probably uh, a handful of televised matches as well. Like we're, and it's the Garden and it's Survivor Series, which at the time was still one of the big five. Yes. You know, I think Survivor Series is the one that took the biggest blow as far as yes. over the course of time not being seen as not seen as nearly as special. Um, but at that time, and King of the Ring to some extent too. Well, it's a big deal because you've just to frame this. You're back in Madison Square Garden mm -hmm. as a sellout. Yeah. Bret Hart is back. He's taking on Stone Cold, who's starting to heat up. You're this new red hot character. You just killed the Undertaker. It's the return of the Undertaker. Shawn Michaels' boyhood dream has come true, and now he's got this unbelievable monster across from him that New York's going to fall in love with. And oh, by the way, somewhere on the undercard, there's this guy named Rocky Maivia who makes a debut. <laughs> what'd he ever do? I don't even know. Who'd he ever like, beat? I, I mean, what's he even doing these days? I believe he has an energy drink, and he can use our help. Well... It's a good, it's the best energy drink. You know what's on my rider here when I show up. Absolutely. You need a, a, a toilet with a washlet <laughs> and two of the Rocks energy drinks. Was it white peach? This is white peach. Yeah. White peach. It's the best tasting and the least unhealthy. I don't know if I could technically say any energy drink drinks are healthy, but I know it gives me that kick I need to get going. I, don't, I just don't think you should rely on them on a daily basis. When I come in here and I want to give my best, I call on the Rocks Energy Drink. And so he is doing that, uh, and he's uh, doing his best to make the world a better place for mankind. On the uh, the house shows leading up to this, it's you and Goldust losing the Taker and Sean and either Armageddon rules or steel cage matches in the main events. Uh, these are matches where only they would only end when one person on a team could no longer continue. Uh, here's some of the, the write-ups about those matches from The Torch. Uh, this is from. November I was wondering 30. why we never hear from Wade Keller. It's always Dave's take on things. So. Dave is uh, like the Coca Cola of wrestling news. I don't know why it is. Now, I enjoy a little Pepsi every now and again. Uh, but the reality is, I do feel like when people talk about star ratings and this and that, yeah. more often than not, they're, they're responding to Dave's take. Right. Would you agree with that? I know you're not yes. on Twitter anymore. Yes, I would think Dave kind of invented the star system uh, for wrestling, I think. Uh, may, uh, if I'm mistaken, I apologize. Uh, but I think, I think Cornette had a hand in it. Oh, really? Because I think TV God was doing it. And maybe Cornette, I don't know. I think Cornette had some okay. sort of hand in it. But again... I just put it out there. I'd like to hear a little more uh, of uh, Keller's thoughts. Just I'm for putting it. it out there. Okay, but let's hear what he said. Undertaker and Michaels beat Mankind and Goldust in an Armageddon cage match. Undertaker got a huge pop, but Michaels came out and topped that. During the match, Undertaker was trapped outside of the cage. Mankind and Goldust locked the door and worked over Michaels. Mankind applied the mandible claw on Michaels and later hung him upside down while the heels charged him. When Undertaker returned to the ring, he cleaned house. The Undertaker choke slammed Goldust and the ref was about to stop the match. But Michael stopped the ref and signaled for the Undertaker to add a tombstone pile driver for added punishment. Undertaker did so, and then Goldust was unable to continue. Man, this is, uh, first of all, I love the pairing of mm -hmm. the quote-unquote oddities of Mankind and Goldust. Yeah. And this is really, you know, we're just days after the Undertaker's dead, and he's on house shows, so I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, but I do like... The idea that Goldust is sniffing around the main events here. Yeah. I mean, he was such a hot character, but it feels like in 97 it starts to dip a little bit. And by 98, it feels like the company maybe has lost faith in him or the character. Or maybe it just wasn't new or fresh anymore. Yeah, I mean, it was. It gets hard to shock people on a weekly basis. Yeah, they so really, they push that line. And at a certain point, uh, they... I, the baby face, inevitable baby face turn, and he becomes a beloved figure and... He has the Tourette syndrome, which is <laughs> oh, funny and awful. We shouldn't laugh, but here we are. <laughs> I awful. mean, you, I feel like a bad person laughing at it at the time, but I did. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, we should. This is not something we should enjoy, but it's funny. Sorry. And I will never think of Tourette's the same after hearing 
your story overseas earlier this year. Uh, I know you've told it before, but just hit us with the Cliff Notes version one more time because it's one of the best Foley stories in all time. Which one? Where you're on stage performing and there's a there's a young man in the crowd who has Tourette's. Are you sure this is my story? Yes. And there's a moment where you feel like you're getting heckled and you don't know. Oh, oh, this is in, uh, this is in uh, New Zealand. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is in New Zealand. All right, yeah, this is just a few months ago. I'm thinking, I don't remember this my wrestling days. Yeah, I'm in New Zealand. Brother, this son of a bitch is sold out. It is. It's a 300-seater. It's sold out. I was a little disappointed. We couldn't sell out Auckland. Uh, you know, similar. Well, I guess we put about 300 people in there. But anyway, it's, it's good. Uh, crowd seems really into it. It's a library. It's uh, the, a small auditorium of the library. It's got a nice, cozy feel. Sound system's kicking. And as I'm doing my thing, I he keep hearing this thing go. About every 30 seconds. And to me, it sounds like Rocky Balboa bouncing that rubber ball while he waits for... Uh, Adrian. <laughs> Not Adrian. The uh, wh What was his, uh, the, the, the loan shark's name? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't. Well, f f really want to get to work on that. And, it, and after about 10 minutes, I go, excuse me, but what is that? And I thought they said it's tech, meaning a technical problem. What they said was it's a tick. So I didn't identify it as a tick. I identified it as a Equipment bouncing problem. ball okay. until I started hearing this <laughs> person drop drop an f bomb now about every every uh, every five minutes, and I finally I go not every five minutes, but every thirty seconds. And as you know, my store my show depends on timing, yes. right? Build up stories, so I need some quiet. And if somebody's stepping on your line, it hurts the show. Yes. And now this individual is stepping on the, uh, stepping on, the, you know, almost every story I'm telling. And I said, "Bring up the lights." I said, "Can I see what's going on out here?" And then the parents say, uh, "Tourette's," and I said, oh, "Okay, all right. I'll let, thank you very much for telling me." I'm gonna turn the lights off. I want you to have a great time and let you know you're, you know, you are very welcome to enjoy the show. And uh, you couldn't do this timing any better. And you know I only drive this when I have to. Go. It's the best. So we get a nice round of applause from the crowd. And the lights come and down. And the lights come down and then you hear, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> It's never not funny. Oh, man. It's the third time I've heard the story, and it's funny every time. Oh, gosh. Oh, man. Uh, so I thought I, oh, that was the biggest pop of the night, for sure. Fantastic. Uh, November 7th, 1996, you guys are in St. John, New Brunswick, in the main event. It's Great mankind. Great city for wrestling. Because really? They're just so... They're so happy to have you there. I mean, Newfoundland, St. John's, it's cold, right? And these are uh, the fir the closest places to Europe, so you have a lot of uh, Irish enclaves, people who still speak with brogues, and they're just so appreciative uh, because they don't get that much right. there. They're really appreciative fans. Um, the main event is Mankind entering the ring. Goldust walks up to him and hugs him. He then kissed Mankind <laughs> on the lips. Late in the match, Michael's ducked, resulting in Mankind accidentally applying the mandible claw to Goldust. Don't you hate when that happens? And Goldust grabs Mankind's crotch in response. It's natural, I guess. And after a few seconds, they both let go, look at each other, and start hugging. <laughs> How much fun are you and Dustin having with this? Because this feels like you, you guys just fucking having a good time more than... Right. Look, I know the fans. Centrally, they're what's most important. I've always believed that we're having fun. They will too. They feel that, and um, you know, it's it's a shame they didn't do more with Mankind Goldust as a TV storyline. Yes. I think it kind of peaked in May when I came up uh, through Goldust Casket. Briefly and, doing the mommy yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, like. yeah, the mommy thing. But the mommy thing was more for uh, localized markets, for local markets. Okay. And uh, Vince Russo's credit, you know, he want, he encouraged me to lead off with, why do birds suddenly appear every time you are... And it was creepy, right? It was unusual. 
And so when Goldust and I, that's when I, he, I started, uh, I, Uncle Paul was already Uncle Paul. I started referring to Goldust as mommy. And it was, we want to creep people out. Yes. We, and so the kid, the kiss on the lips is not supposed to be sexual. It's supposed to be weird. Yes. You know, it's. I don't think. Pe I think people reacted to it not because they were had a hang up on two dudes kissing, but no. because it's gold dust kissing mankind. And so when we would be out on these uh, house shows, we just for like a week straight, I'd go looking for things that I could give gold dust. One day it was a bouquet of flowers. The next it was a pumpkin. And I think I mean, he would look like oh, for me, you know, and I'd yes. be all like, all oh, and it was just so earnest with my gift, you know, like this. And then he would look at it. And then one day he grabbed me and he, he kissed me on the lips and it got such a great reaction. I'm all for the reactions, yes. you know? And so I think, you know, for two or three nights we did that. And I think <laughs> the mandible cloth. Oh, I missed him. Let's put it in the, the different mistaken. guy. So I think the reaction we have that we both loved is that when I put the mandible claw on him and then he put the crotch claw on me, that we were basically running in place going, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a place. Now for those people who say funny isn't money, uh, let yeah, me introduce you to Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Let yes. me introduce you to Stone Cold Steve Austin. Let me introduce you to DX. There's a time and a place to make people laugh, and there's a lot more leniency on the house shows uh, than there is on the, um, the televised events and the pay-per-views. But that was a time and a place to, you know, to make people happy, and that's what it's all about for me. Why did it never air? Why did you guys never do it on TV? Did Vince not see it? Money in it? I don't. I don't know. I think it was just, you know, they call them the marriages. Yes. Uh, Maybe because Goldust had already had his televised run with Undertaker, so it was almost like Going a backwards. handoff. Um, I don't know, but it was really good. It was really fun. It helped me kind of find that character, which is why to this day, you know, when I do the cameos, uh, I sang uh, Jolly Old St. Nicholas on Christmas Eve doing a cameo. And I look over at my wife and she's got tears running down her face because it's so earnest. It's a guy who can't sing singing, but when I'm in that character, Mankind and Dude Love are much more easy. They're, it's easier to do a caricature of the character. Yes. Whereas Cactus Jack is just an old guy with a wig. Yeah. But I, it's going back to that, why do birds? It's just, it's fun to see that character singing. I agree. And so anyone, cameo.com slash Mick Foley. I will bring tears to your eyes with my Christmas. Movie. I love it. I love it. Uh, the night before Survivor Series, a bunch of people near and dear to your heart from your early WWF fandom days go into the 1996 Hall of Fame. It goes down at the Marriott Marquis, and this is the final ceremony until 2004. So we take a little bit of a break from the Hall of Fame, but the inductees on this night in 1996, uh, we see uh, Baron go in, put in by Gorilla Monsoon, Captain Lou Albano, Goes in thanks to uh, radio host Joe Franklin. Johnny Rods is inducted by Arnold Scholar. The unpredictable Johnny Rods. There you go. Killer Kowalski is put in by Triple H. Pat Patterson goes in thanks to Bret Hart. What a speech he had. Uh, posthumously, Vince McMahon Sr. would go in. Shane McMahon would induct him. Johnny and Jimmy Valiant would go in thanks to Tony Gurria. And, of course, Superfly Snuka going in with Don Morocco. Mm -hmm. But, man... That being what happens the night before your pay-per-view debut at Madison Square Garden. How cool is that? That's full circle for you, man. I wasn't there. But it's still a cool yeah, footnote. It is have. a cool footnote. And it's the last uh, Hall of Fame induction ceremony for a while. So that's four, yeah. And I think in a previous episode when we talked about the hardcore ceremony and I was handed the belt and Randy attacked me and threw me down the stairs... And I said that at a, for a while they were going to induct me that night into the WWE Hall of Fame because they, they didn't have the ceremonies. And they, they didn't move to the big arenas, I think, until, until the next year. And ultimately, Stephanie broke the news to me that, you know, the guys in the Hall of Fame are in their 50s, 60s, 70s. You know, at that time, I think I was 36. They thought I should probably wait a while. Um, but that would give you some indication that the Hall of Fame was not as big of a deal. Also, given the character being pretty new, they didn't think that he should be at a 
yeah. a formal, respectful function. The next year, I got the 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 I, got, I won a Slammy, and it was a lot of fun, sitting with the Headbangers and Uncle Paul. That was a good occasion. But at that time, '96, we were still treating that character as if he was not a guy you would see in a tuxedo, sitting uh, calmly at a at a table. Speaking of uh, sitting calmly, let me talk about uh, sleeping easy. Oh, yeah. Did you know that traditional bed sheets can harbor more bacteria than a toilet seat? It can lead to acne, allergies, and stuffy noses. It's just gross. Yeah. Miracle Brand offers a whole line of self-cleaning, eco-friendly bedding, like sheets, pillowcases, and comforters that are going to prevent 99% of bacteria and require three times less laundry. These silver-infused fabrics, originally developed by NASA, we're calling them the Miracle Brand Sheets, are thermoregulating. They're designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long, so you get better sleep every night. These sheets are infused with natural silver that prevent 99.9% .9 of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. No more gross odors. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tags of other luxury brands. And Miracle sheets make the perfect gift for your spouse, your friends, or your family. Who doesn't want better sleep and luxurious feeling bed sheets? And since these come with three free towels, you get two gifts in one just in time for the holidays. So stop sleeping on bacteria. Clean sheets mean less bacteria to clog your pores, fewer breakouts, and other skin problems. So go to trymiracle.com slash Foley to try it today or gift it to someone special this holiday season. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Save over 40% and be sure to use our promo code Foley at checkout to save even more and get three free towels. And Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Brand. Go to trymiracle.com slash Foley and use the code Foley to claim your free three-piece towel set yeah. And save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash Foley to treat yourself, a friend, or a loved one this holiday season. And we thank you, Miracle Brand, for sponsoring this episode. Man, we're getting some cool new sponsors, Come right? Come on, man. As I'm, you're reading that, I'm thinking, I know what the Foley children are getting this Christmas. Some new sheets, baby. Yeah, Michelle go. Marciniak and the people at Sheiks. They got to be shaking in their boots right now. Miracle brand. Let's go, baby. So Stuka not only goes in the Hall of Fame the night before, he winds up being a mystery partner at Survivor Series the following night. Uh, so it's it's pretty cool to think about, you know, your story oh, that yeah. we all fell in love mm -hmm. with as you hitchhiking to the garden to see Superfly and leap off the mm -hmm. top of the cage. It became such a part of your history and mm -hmm. our fandom of you. We just know that's synonymous with you. And to think about here you are, your first pay-per-view in Madison Square Garden, and Snooka's on the show? How cool is that? It's, uh, it's, so, it's so incredible to think he was a colleague. Uh, I'll just uh, say that I had a discussion with the Jungle Boy, Jack Perry, and uh, as at this point, we're taping a couple weeks ahead, we will have seen his cage match with Luchasaurus. No, I think it actually is uh, tomorrow night. Oh. Yeah, the, the, the cage match is tomorrow night. AEW full gear from Ooh. Newark. So let's just say uh, we talked, and I will be watching to see if he heeded my advice. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm uh, watching tomorrow okay, night. Now. Okay. Okay. Uh, I sorry I let that slip, Jack uh, Jungle Boy. We'll edit it out. Yeah, okay. No, no. I think it's cool. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying what I said to do. I gave him some advice. We'll see if it takes place. Can't wait. <laughs> uh, headlined by the title change and the classic match with Bret Hart's return against Steve Austin, the WWF put on a strong Survivor Series before a nearly packed Madison Square Garden. It was only about 900 tickets shy of a legit sellout. 18,647 fans that has 16,266 of them paying $529,522. Which is a huge house at the time. The second largest of North America in 1996. So that's all directly from the Observer, but my goodness, $529 in $1996 is a million bucks now. A million yeah. dollar house is a hell of a deal. Uh, from your book, you would write, on the heels of Buried Alive, I came back against The Undertaker in November's Survivor Series in what was probably the biggest disappointment of my career. In front of the Madison Square Garden fans, I was amazingly mediocre. It was a tough one to put behind me, but I vowed to have a strong showing on the following evening's Raw. So, is it, you think 
you're in your head about having four matches on pay-per-view in a five-month span or just doing a regular match where you didn't get to communicate with him? Or does, is it okay to have an off day? No, there's uh, something more playing into it. And I, I think we touched on this in a previous episode when I don't know if I specified this night. When, I think you told me and Grillo this off air. When, okay, we talked about um, uh, my um, hardcore ceremony um, at the Garden, I think in 2003. Was it 2003? Yeah, 2003. This is where I was saying, you know, at first it was going to be a Hall of Fame induction. And I ended up with uh, 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 Bob Holly and Al Snow, Rob Van Dam, um, a few of the hard good Tommy Dreamer was probably there. I wish I'd thought to have Crash Holly included because it hurt him, but I wasn't excluding anybody. I was just looking at a list I was given and saying, okay, looks good. I was legitimately hurt by the fact that Terry Funk wasn't there, and I exercised that the way you should in a promo two years later. That's the way we handle things. Um, but I said that my wife never, she didn't feel quite comfortable. This was, 99 was when we did uh, 2020, and in a, an attempt to stick up for the business, she was saying things that, with the help of selective editing, made me look bad. Uh, my wife would say, he walks like he's 80 years old, and I would say, but like a sexy 80 year old. But they kind of strung together her quotes, and they were her quotes, in a way that made me look like I was doing a lot worse than I was. But keep in mind, at that point, my wife and I had been together for nine years in 99, and she knows the wear and tear I've taken, and the outside, the general public, still thought it was all fake. And she's trying to stick up for me, does it in a way that, with the help of selective editing, leads Vince to say that she, you know, that she was like Robin Givens. And that's where Vince, I got, I got hot about it, I called Vince. He goes, I meant to say to you that you were like Mike Tyson, very uh, empathetic or sympathetic. I said, but that's not what you said. You didn't say I look like Mike Tyson. You said my wife looked like Robin Givens, and that was a sticking point. Vince called my wife, he apologized to her, but she didn't feel completely comfortable and that actually stems back to July of 96 uh, when I brought my kids on the road, I think for the second time. In fairness to WWE, when I brought them to Savannah, Georgia, my kids had a, <laughs> they cried for 90 minutes. You know, I had to talk with them outside. They're all dressed up. Dewey's in a little tie and always, Noelle's in her dress. So you're going to be good for daddy in there, right? You're going to be good. They went in there and had, they had the fit where the, <laughs> Mucus is coming out of the oh. nose, and you just can't stop it. But nonetheless, that had been a few weeks earlier, and now I'm bringing them to New England. And I can't remember if they were in Portland with me, but they were definitely there the next night in Bangor. And uh, the agent, and I, I don't need to name the agent, may have been overplaying his hand by not allowing my family backstage and ushered them into a bathroom with what appeared to be an open sewage line. And why I didn't stand up right then and say this won't, this doesn't fly, I don't know. I was probably think I've only got a few months in this company, I'm getting a push, I don't wanna rock the boat. That's one thing to do that to me in July, but by November, kind of a big deal. I'm working my fourth pay-per-view with The Undertaker and there's an edict, no wives backstage. Okay, so my wife is celebrating her birthday. We take a trip together to New York to celebrate. She's by herself. She's gonna be going to the show by herself. The edict comes down, no wives. I appeal, you can ask Jim Ross, because Jim, I think, believed in the no wives I'm backstage. I'm gonna cut you off, I wanna ask, how okay. does the edict come out? Do they post something I, the I, I cannot remember okay. I cannot remember but but you knew before you showed up that was the rule I was told okay. that was the rule so now my wife's on her own all day and when I get to the show you're I at find the building at one I'm maybe? at the building at one to me there's no reason why my wife can't be there until six yeah and then find her seat but that's not the case so if the edict is being followed by everyone that's one thing, but if you show up and you see Everybody other wives, wives, girlfriends, 
a companion who'd been met, you know, uh, yes. who had known the wrestler for 24 hours or less. Yes. That's a problem. And now I see it right or wrong as a pattern and I'm, uh, and I'm pissed. And so you can, you can say, and you should say, well, you're a professional, you have to put that to the side. But yeah, I'm more sensitive than most, right? I think that's safe to say. Yeah. And when you get that knot in your stomach, it's a pretty good gauge that something's wrong. I, can, I have an opponent I can't talk to. I've got the pressure of trying to do my fourth pay-per-view and trying to somehow top what we've done in right. stipulation matches. But first and foremost, I'm wondering why I'm being disrespected like this. And it was after that that I did talk to Vince. And I, you know, I don't know if I lay bad words, but I was, I was upset. And I didn't think it was right. I aired that, and he, and he assured me it would never happen again. And it did not happen again. But by that time, the damage had already been done. So I would take my family on house show loops, but far more often I would take one or two of the children with me because my wife never felt completely welcomed backstage. And I don't know, I can't prove this, but I do know I have almost a wrestling free house. You know, there's really nothing there yeah. of wrestling. And I just have wondered in the last week, you know, especially in the past few days, does it have something to do with the way we were made to feel as a family that, uh, you know, one of us wasn't welcomed? And like I said, Vince, in 99, he did call my wife to apologize specifically. And I credit him for that. He did say, Mick, you have my word, that won't happen again. And he was true to that word. But it just felt like I was, it felt like I was being singled out and uh, picked on because I was the new guy. And I think the edict that there were no wives was selectively enforced, and that really bothered me. You know the movie uh, Goodfellas? Yes. In the movie Goodfellas, they talk about, at the Copa, I think it was. <laughs> your wife and your girlfriend. Friday nights are for the wives, <laughs> Saturday nights are for the girlfriends, or right. vice versa. Yeah. Do you think the, no e the edict of no wives was because there were going to be girlfriends there? Or do you remember specifically for sure this was a wife? Because I could see how if there's a guy, listen, this is not really a secret. There were guys who sort of lived double lives. They yeah. had their home life and they had right. their road life. And they lived like a rock star. Well, in this case, there. it was two, two guys with girlfriends. And that's great. They should have been allowed in there. I will even argue, and I have nothing against the, you know, the, and the guy who with the casual relationship was not married. So that was not the concern there. I just, I remember JR like ushering uh, his wife out and saying, okay, uh, no more, you know, like, okay, wives have to leave. Because he was good with that, I guess, that edict that you don't bring. He's your, trying to toe the line. Yeah, toe the line. Um, but like I said, it seemed to be selectively enforced and, uh, Look, you know, we try to bring people back to that moment on this show, right? Yes, yes. And I think people can see that I'm not just phoning it in. I'm trying no. to take people on a ride back there. And I and I did wonder, I thought to myself, should I bring this up? And I was like, if I don't do it, I'm not doing justice to the show and how I felt. And if I was good enough, I could have put it behind me, gone out there and done business. Uh, and the truth is, I saw a few minutes of the match. I've never watched the match back because it brings up bad feelings. Same way I've never watched a match that I called as an announcer because that, that was a period of time I'd rather not revisit. So many of the moments we cover bring back amazing feelings of joy. And it's okay to have the, an occasional heartbreak and a match didn't work out like you'd hoped. I'm fine with discussing those, but when it's a gen general feeling of... Anger and disappointment, those are things that I don't like to go back and relive. Yeah. And I remember seeing two or three minutes of that match with Undertaker and thinking, that actually looks pretty good. I'd be interested to hear what kind of stars it got. I don't think it would have re yielded more than two and a half. Two and a quarter. Two and a quarter. Okay. You nailed it. Okay. Um, it's hard. It's, it's hard. And when I say in today's day and age, I'm saying monthly pay-per-views. I'd say the modern era. Like when I describe... Shawn Michaels is the greatest wrestler of the modern era. I describe the modern era as 
monthly. the era of monthly pay-per-views. Yes. So even though, you, to, out of necessity, it's really difficult to call a match in the ring these days because of the number of cool moves. But on a pay-per-view, you kind of need to have some time with your opponent you know, you can call a match in the ring and uh, and do okay, and that's great on house shows. But on a pay-per-view, especially when you're trying to top what you did three other times on four or five TV matches, I really, we, could, we would have been better served by having some communication, which just wasn't possible because he was up in the rafters most of the day. I just love hearing about the backstage stuff and the way it affected you and your family. Uh, I don't mean to pick a sore spot, but I do want to figure out, do you think this was an agent who maybe didn't like you personally, didn't think that having your kids backstage and maybe their behavior as young people was inappropriate for work, or was it personal with your wife with that agent? Or do you think it was Vince? No, I don't think it was Vince, because when Vince found out, he said, I'm embarrassed, this will never, and I'm not going to do the Vince voice, because yes. I don't think it lends itself well to the, you know, the impersonation makes you smile. It makes you feel happy. Um, I think in the beginning it was an agent overplaying his role. Uh, sometimes you get people, you know, like that who are going out of their way to let you know they're in charge, not just in wrestling, but all aspects of life. I think it was an agent enforcing his will on the new guy. And uh, I just think it was an ill advised policy that should have either been enforced 100% were not brought up at all. And I think, in t I, I, and I can't say that I went to Jim and said, hey, my wife's coming in. I can't tell you I did that. Uh, I mean, I like to play nice almost all the time. And yeah. then I do step up when I feel like I have to. And I wish I'd made a stand right there and said, listen, this is, this is a trip we're taking, you know, but I'd been told, I think I had been told, I'm sorry, don't, no, no wives. And it just, man, it bothered me. And you should say, get over it. And I did get over it, but now we're revisiting things. And then sometimes, you know, if you want to take people on an accurate journey through that time, you got to pick that scab. Yeah. And uh, that's what you've done, Conrad. Sorry about that. Grillo. Grillo! When do you have that conversation with Vince? Right after that, I think. The same night? Uh, or the next day at TV? I don't, uh, it would have been fresh in my mind. So probably the next day. Because it was, you know, match is over, still feeling it, you know. Uh, uh, and the saddest part of all is that my vaunted lovemaking skills turned merely perfunctory later that night because oh I just, yeah. That's that was the greatest tragedy. It's usually a combination of a marathon run and the secrets of the Karma Sutra, and it was just... Uh, and in this time, it's like we've heard before in 88, already? <laughs> Which is a new t-shirt coming your way, Foley is pod shirts, already? If Cheryl in Winnipeg is out there and she remembers our evening in 80, 87. My gosh. <laughs> I got blue chew now. <laughs> We're all set. And by the way... You're Ready be, to redeem myself. <laughs> gonna be looking good, feeling good, thanks to Henson shaving. I I think we all agree that we hate when we get oh, those razor bumps, we get yeah. those nicks, we get those ingrown hairs, and I just hate the uh, the whole subscription model. I have to admit, I fell into that trap, and I wound up getting more razors than I ever actually needed. It was just a hassle. Yeah. Uh, I believe that you need to meet Henson Shaving. Henson Shaving is a family-owned aerospace parts manufacturer. That's made parts for the ISS. That's the International Space Station, yeah. if you live here in Alabama. And the Mars Rover. And now they're bringing precision engineering to your shaving experience. Razor blades are like diving boards. The longer the board, the more the wobble. And the more wobble, well, the more nicks, the more cuts, the more scrapes. A bad shave isn't a blade problem. It's an extension problem. So by using aerospace-grade CNC machines... Henson has made metal razors that extend just 0.0013 inches, which is less than the thickness of a human hair. 
And that means a secure and stable blade with a vibration free shave. How about that? It gets better. The razor has built in channels to evacuate hair and cream, which makes clogging virtually impossible. Yeah. Seriously. Henson shaving wants the best razor, not the best razor business. That means no plastic, no subscriptions, no proprietary blades and no planned obsolescence. The Henson razor works with the standard dual edge blade to give you that old school shave with the benefits of new school tech. And once you own a Henson razor, it's only like three to five dollars a year, year, a year to replace the blades. Think about that. Uh, my first shaving experience, I have to admit, I didn't know what to expect. Thinner than a human hair. How's this going to work? Well, it works fabulously. And man, I love this idea. Think about that. Less than $5 a year in blades. It's been a home run for me. I'm no longer using any of those gimmicky subscriptions. Yeah. I'm a Henson man. You will be too. It's time to say no to subscriptions and yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Visit hensonshaving.com forward slash Foley to pick the razor for you and use code Foley and you'll get two years worth of free blades all with your razor. Just make sure to add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades. When you head to hensonshaving.com forward slash Foley and use the promo code Foley, that's H E N S O N S H A V I N G.com forward slash Foley. And we thank them for sponsoring today's podcast. Man, we're getting some great sponsors, which wouldn't be possible without our listeners. Yes, sir. I've said this before, and you can tell I mean it. I'm not above pandering to people. Especially you. Right here. Yeah, right here. <laughs> People here. In Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not pandering when I say I, thank you for listening. Yes. There's a lot of other shows out there, a lot of really good shows, and I know most people only have time for a couple. Yes. And so if you are listening, you've made a choice to listen, and I really appreciate that. That's why I come in, because I think it, it yields in a better show. I Absolutely. really enjoy myself. I think people can tell even when i cover a difficult subject yes i feel like that's what you deserve and that's what i should talk about and i just uh, i look forward to these shows and i'm very grateful for the opportunity you gave me and the success the show is the show is enjoying that's fantastically fun and even i enjoy doing them in, in person more as well but when we occasionally get the mrs foley run in as she heats up her her sandwich in the microwave it's just an all-time feel-good foley moment like this is classic Mick foley right here <laughs> Hey, uh, for uh, uh, the next show, I'd really like my son Mickey to play my introduction. Got to do that. So uh, he, uh, we're going to bring Mickey, and he's uh, such a great young man. Maybe three shows from now. Three shows. Yes, yeah, three shows from now. Yeah. So which show would that be? Be uh, close to Christmas close time. To my Christmas. goodness. Close to yeah. He'll be he'll be with me. Yeah, sorry, he'll be with me in uh, December. Looking forward to that. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about the match. I know you don't love the match. It only goes 14 minutes and 52 seconds. Uh, Paul Bear, of course, is in the shark cage above the ring. The Undertaker is going to come out with a new ring costume, dropping from the ceiling in a ring outfit with bat wings and a new haircut. Uh, it's just a way to debut a new Undertaker who does more wrestling, according to Meltzer's recap. The thing that stuck out to me was not only the, uh, the bat wings, which was a little mm -hmm. odd, but he had the teardrop tattoo under the eye, which I had learned from watching HBO as a teenager, because that's what you do when you're really excited about it. That meant, I guess, in, in prison culture, you had murdered someone. Uh, not say murdered, killed a man. Oh, well, there you go. Killed a man, yeah. Well, you killed a man the month before, so technically you should have had the teardrop tattoo. <laughs> he was just, he should have had X's over his eyes or something. You deserve the teardrop. Meltzer would say this match made psychological sense, but was nowhere close to the level of some of the previous mm. matches these two have had. Also, after doing a boiler room match and buried a live match where Undertaker was all but killed, it's hard to put the two guys in a regular match and yep. get the people jazzed about it. Yeah. Most of the way, it was Undertaker working on Mankind's fingers. Mankind took a backdrop over the guard railing as they were fighting in the stands back into the ring area. He came back with a running flip off the apron to the floor, and at one point, Undertaker had Mankind by the throat for the choke slam. But Mankind got the mandible claw at the same time. Because the hands had been worked on, the claw didn't work to its normal level of effectiveness, and Undertaker was able to hit that choke slam. Mankind came back using a foreign object, but Undertaker hit the tombstone for the win. Bearer was lowered into the ring, but before Undertaker could do anything to him, the executioner nailed him from behind. Taker came back and ran off executioner in a weak sequence. 
two and a quarter stars. And of course, we know that sets up Executioner and Undertaker for the December pay per view down in Florida. In your house, it's time. I believe that was St. Petersburg. So the reason me being, I remember. <laughs> we, I don't know if we're allowed to use footage, but um, well, we'll I believe St. Pete. They had like a fountain. Oh, out in, out in front. Yeah. yeah, out in front, and that uh, Terry Gordy ended up taking a bump. It got the, soaking wet. It got soaking wet. We came out like West water Palm. Was, West Palm. Yeah. Was, water was splashing out of his boots. And I don't know if Paul Barrow was out there with him because I could have sworn he was backstage and he kind of <laughs> he put verbiage, Gordy's verbiage was, aw, hell. <laughs> like, <laughs> aw, hell. Because Terry was such a likable, aw shucks guy until the bell rang, especially back, you know, before he had the, yeah. the accident on the plane. Uh, and I think that was the end of Terry. Yeah, uh, wet boots and that was uh, it. Yeah, I think that was the end of that run there. So, hey, I'm in agreement with Dave. It underperformed for some of the reasons he detailed, the uh, personal struggle that I was not professional enough to overcome. But I think it was a lot to ask that we come back for a fourth pay-per-view. and With a regular uh, match. With a regular match, yeah. And especially with an opponent who... Uh, uh, I remember thinking after the match, wow, that was a long way to go, meaning, you know, a long way to go to have him up there for hours incommunicado. What we got out of it wasn't worth what we lost. So, yeah. Uh, hey, I... A for effort, but uh, man, not not a highlight. Nonetheless, I think we had a pretty good episode talking about a pretty bad match. Listen, I, I thought it was great. Lots of fun sidebars, um, and the match itself, I don't think is nearly as bad as you do, but I do think just the way it all happened in terms of boiler regular match, then boiler room, then buried alive, then a regular match. Maybe it shows that there wasn't as much thought put into future planning like we used to hear that it used to go wrestlemania to wrestlemania and they would work backwards uh and they would sort of try to tell these sort of year-long stories and we have really long programs here i mean this is a multiple month thing but it does feel like buried alive probably should have been the blow off or maybe boiler room brawl and that's when paul bear turns i don't know but if you had to do over again maybe you would shuffle a little bit of it but Boy, you're off to the races, man. I mean, you're an established character now. Yes, he's finally got a pinfall victory over you, but, and I guess technically he won the Buried Alive match, but that's not what anybody remembers. Right. Yeah. Uh, the big takeaways, of course, from that pay-per-view are um, the phenomenal Bret Hart and Steve Austin match. No, let me also, the other, uh, not to come up with multiple excuses, but we did talk about a previous episode about how badly, uh, how badly, bad my back was yes following SummerSlam, and it really wasn't until march of 97 that i started getting some relief and i was re- really in a bad way just in constant pain that's when the weight started getting put in on because that's how i you know coped. and yeah i coped with it i wasn't a pain pill guy um but just traveling the country when you're really hurting like that it was it was difficult uh, so I, I had forgotten about that, but that would damage the quality of my matches for a while. I even pulled out that great match with Sean. We had a good gimmick match, very good gimmick, good gimmick match with Undertaker. But, uh, just getting through each day was, was pretty difficult at that time. So the Brett Austin match. Yeah. Did you have a chance to see that one? Did oh, you it was it? so good. So good. So good. Yeah, I, mean, I know that everybody talks about the WrestleMania 13 one, but this is one of the forgotten If they hadn't matches. torn that house down in November, it probably would not have been a WrestleMania 13 match. Yeah. So these guys, they just had such chemistry uh, right off the bat. Steve's really coming into his own. The character's catching fire. I don't know if it would have done nearly as well without Brett there. Uh, you know, that that program with Brett was so good. Two guys, like, tailor-made for each other. Just a great program. The show stealer, for sure, that night. What about uh, Rocky Mavia? He makes his debut that night. What, what were your first impressions of him out there with that pineapple Willie haircut and Jim Ross saying he's a blue chipper? And I mean, nobody would have uh, ever predicted what it became. I would but say, did you uh, think you saw something? I would say he was a nice guy. He did something, a little bit. <laughs> Do you know the, it's an, he's a nice guy. 
So uh, this goes back to Owen Hart wrestling Dan Severn. Oh, yes. And I yes. had to go out there. He goes, oh, he's a, he's a good guy. Nice. I go, but how was the match? And Owen turns to me and goes, he's a nice guy. <laughs> Yeah, Lord bless him. We all start somewhere. Uh, it's but, I, I, but in return, none of us saw the Rocky Maivia thing come in. So when I see the advertisements for Young Rock, they have Rocky doing the crossbody onto 90, uh, 1997 uh, Mankind. And I need to see that episode. I met the, the actor who portrays me and met him in Australia Talked to him for about 90 minutes on the phone before he filmed it. And then I was dismayed when I saw the show. I was like, I was on it for 10 seconds. But he's got this feeling for what made the character tick. And hopefully, you know, this season it's a little more fleshed out. But I specifically remember that moment. Richmond, Virginia. I think it's May 97. Uh, Grillo. Find out. Main, Richmond pay-per-view. He comes off with the crossbody, which is his finisher, which we've seen him win matches with. Was he inter IC champion at one point? Yeah, he had at, lost it at that He point. lost it, but he was an IC champion. In February. Yeah. Clearly a pushed guy who has won big matches with that move. He goes up. He comes off with the crossbody. I roll through and come up with the mandible claw. Brother, you talk about a road warrior-esque baby face pop. I couldn't believe it. And it was indicative of how much people hated that character. Is this the Cold Day in Hell pay-per-view you're talking uh, probably about? Probably so. Yeah. Probably so. And then I think within a month or two, he joins the nation, and the rest is history. Well, we also know the, the show would finish that night with Sid becoming the man, of course. He's supposed to be the heel, and he is going to attack Jose Lothario, uh, the white meat babyface champion's um, mentor. mentor. Yep. And... Boy, this New York crowd eats it up. I mean, Sid, who is the bad guy, comes out fist bumping fans, and they're all into it. What is it about that? You laugh at a fist bumping fans? <laughs> no, I'm about Sid at Madison Square Garden. This is a famous story. Where look at this? Like I said, this, the Gaga that Goldust and I did. You know, it's one thing. You know, New New Brunswick and Newfoundland. <laughs> But you don't pull some of that stuff at the garden, especially no. when Vince is there. And so I see Sid at six foot eight, and he's doing the, his, his opponent powders out, and Sid starts doing a <laughs> buck, buck, <laughs> buck, buck, buck stuff. And then he goes over and you hear Howard Finkel go, It has been. <laughs> I can't remember his opponent's name. Just say it was, pick a name, Savio Vega. He goes, <laughs> it has been verified. Savio Vega is indeed a chicken. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, so, so we're watching at the corner. Here's Sid at six foot eight, 310 pounds, solid muscle. Buck, 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 buck. And Vince turns, he goes, is he imitating a chicken? <laughs> and it, it was after that that we started doing the announcements. We, we started playing it up based on how much Vince hated it. And, you know, house show, brother, we had some fun at the house shows. But I think in this case, it was Vince going, is he imitating a chicken? And you hear Briscoe or Pat go, uh, yeah, yes, Vince, I think he's going. I never want to see anything like that again. Same thing he said about me throw you know with the cell but in this case said no he wasn't big about the chicken killer. Free zone. yeah yeah the you know, there's a time and a place and that wasn't the time or the place sid has always been uh, as a wrestling fan one of my guilty pleasures i just thought he was awesome what a presence uh, he looked cool the way he would just look at the crowd and sort of hold them in his yeah. hands and that entrance at, at Survivor Series 96 is one of the all-timers because he just comes off like such a badass. I don't know why the long-term connection wasn't there. I was in Memphis. He'd already had his run in Continental as uh, Lord Humongous. Yes. Right? And uh, Shane Douglas was there. Shane was one of my best friends. Still a good friend. You know, you drift as you do sometimes in wrestling. But... Uh, Sid knew that I knew Shane, and this was Sid's really first time wrestling without the mask, at least first time as a pushed character. And from the moment he got in the ring, it was clear that he had that 
it factor. Mm -hmm. And I think Shane said that when he tried out, when Sid tried out for WCW, where Shane moved on to from, uh, from Continental, he was there when Sid had his tryout. And when Sid got down on that one knee and did this, that Ric Flair just turned to whoever it was and said, he's got it. You know, it being the biggest uh, two letter word in the, the language. And I wonder why that long-term connection wasn't there. And I'm, I'm not knocking Sid, but, um, but when you do the conventions, he's not there with the big eight or 10 guys that people flock to see. And I don't know why that was, because he was so charismatic. Do you think he uh, was, as Jim Ross would say, because he always says on Grilling JR, cheap plug, that it always comes down to him as far as putting together a company or a team or running talent relations, whatever you want to call it, reliability. Perhaps that was Sid's issue, that he wasn't as reliable as maybe the offices would have liked? I don't know. We can cover Sid at length at a, another time, probably. He's a really interesting character and case study. Yeah. But we've seen a handful of those guys. I have people who were pushed as much bigger stars, were thought to be the futures of their respective companies. And you could see as time went on that people who were not as pushed or as well compensated had garnered a more, a, a longer enduring a fandom, if that makes sense. Let's do some questions. We got tons of questions. All right, let's do it. Uh, Shone Cold, great name, wants to know fantasy booking. Shone Cold? Shone Cold. Okay. I like that. Fantasy booking, turning Mankind's match with Taker into a traditional four on four Survivor Series match that year. Who would make up the teams on each side? And what would Mick name his team? Oh, man. So Goldust is on there. Right. Goldust is on there. This Maybe Vader? Yeah, Leon should have been on. I would think... Who would the fourth one be? Executioner. Executioner, yeah. So what, what's the name? What, what is it? Man, Mankind's Maulers? Something corny like that, right? Uncle Paul's. Oddities. Punish. Yeah, oddities. Before there was oddities. Yeah. Something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, another follow-up here. In all your years in the WWF, you never actually participated in a traditional Survivor Series nope. match. Is that something you wish you would check the box for? Absolutely not. <laughs> you would say that. After those first couple of years, it, it wasn't just, the uh, same. You know, like, hey, you throw stuff at the wall, and, the, you know, Royal Rumble was a direct hit, right? That was a bullseye. Survivor Series and even King of the Ring, you know, King of the Ring became a coronation ceremony that two or three people really took full advantage of. I still call Booker King. Every time I see him, the King Booker because of everything he did with that. Uh, but it was became a way to bump somebody up in the lineup. It and in and of itself wasn't the big the big draw. Um, so no, no, I was never uh, after the first couple of years. I realized they were good matches. But it was essentially, it reminded me a lot of like the eight-man tags in Japan where lots of guys doing lots of cool stuff, but not a great story. Nothing of any consequence. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of a throwaway. I'm glad they're doing different stuff. I did see when uh, on that Survivor Series when I was the, the GM in 2016, the one where uh, Bill Goldberg beat Brock so quickly and shocked the world, they had a couple of great Survivor Series matches on that card. But I don't think the Survivor Series concept translated as well as Royal Rumble. And, uh, you know, the big three are Royal Rumble, uh, Survivor, uh, SummerSlam, and Mania. Yeah. I would totally agree. I think there's maybe a right and a wrong way to, to sell pay-per-view matches. And lots of adults choose to use nicotine, and there's a right and wrong way to do that, too. Get ready. This is an ad for Lucy Breakers. If you're one of the millions of adults who use nicotine, you know that not all products are the same. And there's one new product that stands above the rest. Lucy Breakers are the only nicotine pouch that gives you a blast of flavor from the first moment to the last. Each pouch contains a capsule that you break open to release a rush of flavor that doesn't fade away like those other pouches. You know, the ones that rhyme with thin. And they come in so many flavors. Mint, berry, citrus, mango, even espresso. And you don't have to go to the gas station or corner store to get them. Just order online and they'll be shipped straight to your door. And every order gets free shipping. Plus, if you subscribe, you'll save 15% and never run out. So whether you use nicotine while working, creating, or playing, 
Lucy Breakers are the intelligent choice. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Get $10 off your first order when you use our promo code Foley at checkout. And shipping is always free. That's lucy.co, promo code Foley, to receive $10 off and free shipping. Visit lucy.co for more details. And we thank Lucy for sponsoring the podcast. Now here comes the fine print. Lucy products are only for adults of legal age, and every order is age verified. This product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. One more time, that's lucy.co, and the promo code is Foley to save $10 off and get free shipping. Uh, as a fan, I've always found the short entrance way of MSG really unique. How does this feel as a performer, as you don't have that same long walk to the ring as opposed to the crowd? I guess you could walk out with them right on top of you. Yeah. Yeah, you have to maximize your time. Uh, aesthetically, the garden is such a beautiful place to work in, but you only have a minimum amount of time. Even with the uh, I Quit match with The Rock, you know, we take it out up the aisle, the ramp. The ramp's only about, uh, is it 30, 40 feet long? Uh, and so people can either look at it as a detriment or a benefit. I liked it, and I love the garden, so uh, I, I was okay with it. Lucas Kinzer wants to know, Mr. Foley, how do you think Terry Gordy would have fared in the late 80s as a monster heel for Hulk Hogan with his size and athleticism? There could have been some excellent oh, matches in man. Terry's prime. Yeah, Terry was so good. He was so good. He worked strong style before there was a term for it. Um, I don't, you know, I'm, he was so good that he could have adapted and done a wonderful job with Hogan, but I don't think that's where his heart was. You know, like uh, the guys in All Japan, I can only speak for All Japan, they were a, they were like a team of outlaws, yes. you know. And they were guys who didn't uh, adhere to the normal rules. They kind of did their own thing. Uh, uh, Gordy was in WWF for like a week mm -hmm. because uh, for my parents' anniversary, I took them to see Snuka versus Piper in August. Uh, it was the last time we saw Snuka for a long time, so I don't know if that was 80, uh, 80 maybe 84. Uh, but on the, on the wings of the uh, rock and roll, rock and wrestling mm -hmm. uh, connection, uh, Cindy Lauper's manager, Dave Wolf, had brought in uh, the Freebirds, and they were gone in a week. And I know there's a story to that. But those guys, they were just out of control, like, you know, in the best of, like, I remember, you know, going to Gary, Indiana, and buddy Jack Roberts goes, oh, this is the building I pissed on Vern Gagne in. I was like, what? You peed on Vern Gagne? And that was just one of the things, they would walk up like they're having a conversation, and then you would feel them peeing on your leg. And that's just kind of the things Freebirds did. Another story, legend, but I'm, this is not something that just come out of thin air, is that, uh, Buddy was going off on some kind of a trip solo. So they played a rib on him by finding a roadkill, possum, raccoon, or arm, whatever it was, put it in, in uh, Buddy's bag oh, in his trunk in the sweltering uh, uh, Texas summer. Anyone else would have taken that bag, held their nose, and gotten rid of it. Buddy actually uh, cleaned it out and continued to use the same gear? The same gear, the same bag. <laughs> the ribbles on the guys then. <laughs> yeah, the ribbles on the guys. Yeah. But they were great. Uh, I mean, you know, Michael Hayes' mind has really contributed so much. Gordy was phenomenal. And Buddy Jack, he was he was re he was really good. I mean, I remember babysitting his son Brandon when I was in world class. His wife Janice sold the merchandise. You know, uh, I remember Janice caught Buddy making out with a girl <laughs> in New Orleans. And Buddy telling her he was just working. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm out for like My the, gosh. the early morning 2 a.m. breakfast, and she's got a promo on him because she caught him kissing another woman. And I, I was just working. <laughs> My God, what a great line. I was just working. A new shirt coming yeah. your way from foliuspodshirts.com. Uh, we'll be back next week doing something we haven't done before, or maybe we have, but it's been a while. Ask Mick anything. We're throwing you guys the keys to the kingdom here. You're going to get to ask Mick anything you want. Uh, we would love to have uh, you like the show, subscribe to the show if you dig it. If you think we've earned it and we're working hard for you, throw us a five-star review. We'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, we got some Twitter handles to share with you. Not yet for Mick, but I'm still there. Uh, hey, hey, it's Conrad, and you can still ask your questions about anything we're doing. At Foley is Pod. Throw us a follow there, at Foley is Pod. And our, maybe our new favorite place for us to direct you 
is youtube.com forward slash Folius pod. Throw us a like there, hit the subscribe button and turn on the notifications bell. We're going to have some little, uh, extra bonus content there where we'll keep the cameras rolling a little bit every now and again, throw you a little nugget on there. And it's a great way to introduce someone new to the show. Cause some of our shows, man, they go two or three hours. That can be intimidating. How but, long did this one go? Uh, we're at like two and a half hours. So I can see how, man, I don't have time for that. Yeah. But direct them over, check out some clips. They're going to love it. We'll become a part of their regular routine. I am hearing from more and more people who say they turn it on on their way to work. And unlike music, which I love, but music doesn't make time fly like a good conversation. I agree. Sometimes I'd be on the road, you know, eight, ten hour drive. You listen to some kick-ass music and only 30 minutes have gone by. Yeah. And I do know, and I part of the reason I hesitated to do the podcast. I said, Conrad, you're like I'm like Rocky Balboa, and the condominium. Yes. Says, I never use them, and I'm like I don't even listen to podcasts. Like I feel like a hypocrite for having my own. Uh, but I do remember when I was on the road in uh, British Columbia, just driving ungodly miles with a great comic named Tim Sullivan. Tim had all the podcasts, and time was just whoa just going by in the blink of an eye. So for any of you uh, listening to Foley's pod on your way to and from work or anywhere, we really appreciate it. Absolutely. Check us out. YouTube.com Foley's pod. We'll be back next week doing ask Mick anything right here on Foley's pod. Have a nice day.